start working. By the way, if you have one second, please click the like button. That also makes a big difference for my videos and also helps other people see this video because they can see that there is an interaction on the video itself. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. So let's look at the first ticket we have here and that's RDP sound issues. It says here, hi, I use remote desktop to access my second PC, but audio comes what I did like the very first member. of my channel so what i did in this video we have a couple of different issues. The first one is RDP sound issue. And then we have another ticket for a local admin account that is not working. By the way, if you have one second, please click the like button. That also makes a big difference for my videos and also helps other people see this video because they can see that there is an interaction on the video itself. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, so let's look at the first ticket we have here, and that's RDP sound issues. It says here, hi, I use remote desktop to access my second PC, but audio coming from that computer is not working. So there are a couple of reasons why somebody would want to have a second PC and use a remote desktop. And the first one is, they literally have a second PC which has specific software, specific documents, specific files, this and that, and they have a second PC that they want to access. And the only way for them to do it, especially in a business type of environment, is using regular Microsoft built-in remote desktop. The other reason is that somebody literally has a second computer as part of their job to process um, certain files, maybe databases, or do certain view power, you know, this and that. You know, maybe there are other reasons as well, but those are just a couple of examples of somebody using a second PC and using it via remote desktop. So he's using remote desktop to access this second PC, but he can't hear any audio coming from that. So it's kind of like this. You see in this computer here where I'm basically recording this, you can see that the name of my computer here is tech support. This tech support computer is a remote desktop session. So if I play any audio on here, for example, I go to YouTube and I play a video, um, I'm not able to hear any audio and that's his problem here. So we can fix that. So first thing we have to do is open up remote desktop session on user's computer, on his computers, on Mike's computer, we open up a remote desktop session and then we click here, show options. We're going to expand options and uh, we're going to go to the third tab where it says here, local resources. And the first thing that comes up is remote audio. So we're going to click on settings where it says here, configure remote audio settings. So this is exactly where we need to go. So we're going to click on settings. So this computer here is, uh, well, this remote desktop session is set up to play audio on this computer. So by default, it's set like this. If I was to use a remote desktop session on this computer to connect to a second computer over there, um, it will play audio from that computer on my computer. Okay. I don't want this to sound too confusing, but let me just show you. So if I go to youtube.com forward slash Kobo man. It's going to, okay. My first time going to my own channel on this computer. Anyways, any audio that you see here right now is actually being played on the remote computer itself. That's exactly what his problem is. So in order to fix that, we have to make sure that its settings are set to this play on this computer. Otherwise we can't hear this 
voice at all, as you can saw. Right now, on my computer, which is here, where it says tech support, I'm using remote desktop. Right now, it's set to play audio on the other computer, which is this setting. So on the second PC, wherever it may be, this is what it's set like right now on my computer that I'm using right now. It's playing on remote computer right now. So to fix this, we have to make sure that it's set to play on this computer, which should be set by default. And, uh, and, and that's fine. This is how we would fix that. But I also want to show you something else. So let me complete that ticket. And we're going to come back to this because I really want to talk about something here that's going to be also related to troubleshooting. Very important. And let's wrap this up. So we're just going to add internal note and say change remote desktop settings to play audio audio on a local computer okay and then we're going to of course have him test it you know this and that that's fine this should be easy ticket and then we're going to close it of course of course don't forget to assign ticket to yourself as well very important so you can get credit before you close it and since we know Mike, Mike Moser, we've worked with him many, many times. Uh, we're going to just close it. We're going to let him know, hey, it should be fine now. So we're done with Mike. But I do want to go back to that remote desktop connection to show you something very, very important. So let me explain what I mean. If you get a ticket that a user cannot use their local headset, for example, they have a headset somewhere, their user is somewhere else and you need to troubleshoot their headset sound issues. And you can't, because if you use remote desktop session, let's say you're limited to only using remote desktop session, it's gonna look just like this. You remote into their computer, just like I am connected to this tech support computer right now, and it's gonna look like this. It's just gonna say remote audio. There is no headset to select. There is no audio to troubleshoot. Here, let me show you. If I go to sound settings here, it just says remote audio. There is nothing else. There is no headset to select. So you would assume that something is wrong, right? Well, that's that's not right. The, the problem is, is actually this. You have to go to local resources before you connect to that computer. You have to go to local resources on your remote desktop session, click settings, and select play on remote computer, just like we had it previously. And then you go in, and then you type in user's computer name, you click connect and then and then we can make changes to the local see now it's looking looking like it's different uh it made <laughs> it made different settings here you see now we can select speakers that are real tech which is the typical uh you see how i got confused because i made the change right away it took a little bit to configure but yeah now we can actually see that there is real tech uh, definition audio same thing if i go over there and plug in a headset you will see it come up as well all right so you probably saw you probably saw that i plugged it in now we can troubleshoot that headset on that remote computer so you would just say to the user or ask them to plug in their headset if it's not showing up like that and then you'll be able to do it otherwise if you don't change it to play on the local computer like i showed you you won't be able to troubleshoot it and you will just assume that there is something wrong with the audio you know you have to make sure that it's set play on remote computer you know otherwise it's, you won't be able to troubleshoot it so that's something to keep in mind if you only have remote desktop connection as the available resource of taking control of somebody's computer and troubleshooting these type of issues all right I hope that comes off as something that you can easily follow because it is kind of confusing and but it is what it is this is how you have to kind of go about it and to to troubleshoot some of these weird issues that might come up okay doki all right so let's look at this other ticket it says my local admin account is not working and it specifically says here hello i have a local admin account to make changes on my pc but it's not working Thanks, Larry. 
So this guy was given specific local admin account to use for some reason. And of course, uh, don't ever, if you, have, if you have the ability, don't ever give somebody a local admin account password uh, because of the security reasons. You, we have to you know, double and triple check to make sure that this person is actually allowed. So we're going to go with that assumption. All right, let's assign the ticket to ourselves. We're going to work that. We're going to contact him and ask him, hey, what is the name of the local admin account that you're trying to use? So, and then he tells you what the name is and then we're going to search for it in on our computer. Now, this is not to be confused with the main admin accounts. Those are different. They will not be listed under local admin users. So we're going to just type in users here to get to the point where we can add or edit and see which users or which accounts are available there to begin with. This is just one way of looking at this. This shows you some administrator accounts. And the other way is if you go to the system settings or system properties, and then we look at advanced system settings, and then we click on user profiles, we're going to see all the accounts that are listed here. However, there is a big difference here, what we're looking at. We're looking at two very different things. And I want to kind of emphasize this. This is why I created this uh, fictitious ticket is that what we're looking at here is local accounts that are on the computer. When it comes to this window here, this is where you would add them. These are all the actual account login information that's available on this computer. Now, what we are looking at here is actually user profiles that are stored. So this is location or this is how much space is taken up by creating a local profile on the C drive. This is not a this is not information for this person's for any of these accounts. This is just what's stored locally. And the thing is though although that describes this, if you were to click and delete this profile it would delete it everything that's in stored on this computer meaning all of these things are located on the c drive so if you go to local users on the c drive so c users you can see that they are here here is the, the first one here is the Kobelman test account which is this one and here is the yt login is this one so if i click delete on any of these which i can't delete this one this one never shows up uh, if you're using it, uh, it's kind of bizarre, but this one is actually on here as well. It's not showing up. I don't know if that's some kind of a feature of Windows, but this YT login actually does exist on this computer as well because I'm using it right now, but yet it's not listed, and I know it's an admin account. It doesn't matter. Getting back to the point of what I'm talking about here, if I select, for example, this one, BUCO, and then I select Delete, it will delete everything that's inside of this folder. So anything that's inside of here, desktop, documents, everything, everything will be deleted. Okay, now that we understand what that is, we're going to cancel out of this. I'm gonna leave this window open here because we're gonna get back to it. What we're going to do, what I actually wanted you to learn from this fictional ticket um, is what happens when you can create when you create a local admin account or try to use another account on a computer um, to troubleshoot issues for example let's say you need to use an admin account to fix something or to run specific application this is what happens when you do that so what we're going to do here we're going to create a local uh, microsoft account and we're going to name it local admin not a very secure name but it doesn't matter because you know this is just for practice and it's forcing me to do all this stuff now okay so now we have another local admin we're going to change type to administrator so this is just the standard user. We're going to change it to administrator. Now we have a local uh, local account that's administrator account. However, if you go to the settings here in user profile, you can see that it's not there. There's nothing there. And then if we go to the root of C again, we know we have the local profile. We go to root of C, we go to users. It's not there. Well, why is that? 
because I want you to know that this completely separates this account from the stored data on the computer in the sense that there is no local profile created, only a local admin account. So it's only a local admin account until you log in to this computer for the first time or or if you use for example your own local admin account whether it's domain or local it doesn't matter let's say you're troubleshooting something let's say you're troubleshooting something and you want to run for example this google chrome as administrator in order to troubleshoot some things you can literally right click this icon and click run as administrator and on a business restricted computer um, you will get a pop-up to log in to use your local credentials but since i'm already logged in as admin on their another account it's not going to give me that so what i'm going to do is hold shift right click this google chrome icon so i'm holding shift key on the keyboard and now we have an option to run it as different user otherwise it doesn't show up run as different user doesn't show up here let me show you right click it's just run as administrator but if i shift right click run as different user so that's what we're going to select i apologize this is this is just a glitch here run as different user this is just a scaling issue with my uh with my monitor but it's basically asking me here to put in my login credentials so we're going to do we're going to use this local admin so it's same thing if you have a domain admin you would type in the same login id so we're gonna your your own local id or your your domain admin id i'm sorry so but in this case we're going to use this one so we're going to type in local admin so if I tab over, it's actually in the password space. I'm sorry, you can't see it. It's because of the scaling on this 4K monitor and using remote desktop session specifically. So if I click OK, I've typed in local admin and the password below. You just can't see it. And I'm just going to click OK. And now it's going to run Chrome under that specific account, under that specific local administrator account. So this is useful if you're trying to update the computer and you need to use your own administrator login. So right now, this specific window and only this window is running under that local admin and separately from this other ticket window. It's run separately. To prove it to you, we're going to go back to our folder and we can see now that there is a local admin <clears throat> profile created because we use that local admin to run as as admin on this computer so it actually actually had to create settings folder inside of that you can see that you see so this is how these things work and let me show you this here we, got, we don't need this here anymore but i want to go back to here user profiles files we can see that local admin show up and it's right there and you can see it's only 78 megabytes that's very very tiny and usually when a user logs in for the first time into computer it's going to create a much larger local profile but the reason this one here is only 78 megabytes is because it only created a basic sort of like a template information for this local admin profile on this computer just so we can run and store settings for chrome okay and then we're going to let me see if i can open it here and we're going to and here it is you can see that there's some basic documents here and then there's app data and then if we go to for example local google chrome folder is there al along with microsoft it's just the basic Microsoft stuff that comes with default um, default settings for the Microsoft operating system. But it has that Google Chrome that we just opened. You see that? And it says 98 megabytes, but that's because, you know, it, by the time we opened it up, Google Chrome itself had actually, you know, stored some data on its own, this and that. And uh, <laughs> so that's how that works. But the great thing about this, if you have somebody, a remote user, who's never logged in to a computer before. Let's say somebody takes their computer home and they can't log into it 
for some reason, but you have remote desktop access to it, uh, you can uh, basically do the same thing to get it going. So uh, it, it's kind of a workaround, but uh, it, and it's kind of confusing, I know. But as long as you can get this local ad local profile uh, created and get it going, that way when somebody locks their computer, they can literally type in the same thing and just get access to this without having to be connected to the network in order to log into this computer for the first time. Okay, that was quite a bit and I hope this wasn't too confusing. Hopefully it gives you an idea of what's going on with these profiles. And again, whether it's a local profile or domain profile, it's going to act the same way if you run it as admin or run as different user. But this is what happens in the background while you're doing all of this stuff. Okay, so I'm just going to reply to customer and say, hello, Larry. I've created a local admin profile named local admin. And the password is you know, XXXXX, whatever. Clearly what you want to do because then everybody will see it. Matter of fact, I would just tell them what it is, but we're, I'm just going to pretend like we're doing this, which you shouldn't necessarily do at all because, you know, whoever looks at your ticket and God knows how many people, they'll know what the local admin uh, login ID is and password. So you might want to just, you know, tell him or I don't know, whatever the, 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 the settings are or whatever the setup or requirements are for the company uh, when it comes to dealing with, you know, giving out passwords like this and login IDs as well. All right, guys, I hope you like this video. Please take a moment to like, share and leave a comment. Let me know if you have any ideas for future videos and I'll see you next time. Bye bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kuboman. Today we have a combination of videos, so that way you don't have to go through and look for these topics. This way you can just sit down and watch the whole thing at once, because it's very useful, especially for help desk. The first part of the video is about practical help desk troubleshooting. Uh, it's a very good one, uh, because in this example you're not allowed to use RDP whatsoever. The second part, it talks about Windows updates and how they are important to understand if you're in help desk or even desktop support. And the last part of it, if you're new to help desk or want to get into IT, this last video shows you how to create a resume. This resume is based off my own resume and based off its own success. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Please take a moment to like. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Let's get into it. All right, here we go, guys. I've created a couple of tickets that we can work on. And the first one right here, it says, my program is not working. Now, keep in mind, again, we don't have access to remote desktop. We don't have any tools like Daimware or VNC or anything remote that we can use or any third-party remote software that we can use in order to help this user with their issue. So their issue is here, my program is not working. And uh, in the description it says here, every time I click on a program icon, nothing help, nothing happens. Please help me. Thanks, Larry B. So here's the thing. Uh, first thing we got to do is actually ask Larry what his PC name is. Once he comes back with that information, we can start to work with that. So you may have to call him, you know, talk to him and say, hey, Larry, uh, what is your PC name so that way we can try to help you out but of course be more professional like you would call him and say hey this is for example for example this is Irvin I'm with end user support and I have your ticket about my program is not working I can help you but uh, can you please tell me what your PC name is so we're, we're, we're what we are going to do with that PC name is try to remotely access it However, first thing first thing first, we gotta assign this ticket to ourselves. So I'm going to assign it to myself. <laughs> I, although this is not a ticketing video, I always want to make sure that that's happening. But so I'm going to actually reply here and also tell him, hello, this is Irvin with EUS end user support. Can you please tell me? what your PC name is. So 
of course I wanted to give you as detailed as possible how you'd work this so this is why I kind of put this note in which in reality it should send them a, an email or a notification of some sort so he can respond to you with that information or again you can just talk to him call him you know get in contact with him to get this information so that way you can take a look and see what's going on again we don't have rdp so there is no gui that we can look at here uh, and uh, we're just going to use uh, pc name as that so let's go to the pc the the user's pc so we can find that out real quick so here we are this is the user's computer so while they're on it you can just instruct them how to get their pc name if they don't know how to so we can say Larry, can you please go to your search bar? And the reason I'm going about it in this way is because users are very familiar with the search bar because they always look at it. And you can just tell them, click inside the search bar and just type in system or PC or, or whatever you feel comfortable with because there are multiple locations where you can find the PC name. So here is just the system that comes up. And then you can tell them, hey, where does it say system name? And here it is. It says Kobuman 1. So once he gives you that information, we're going to go back to our computer. So now we know that the PC name is, I'm adding an internal note. PC name is Kobuman 1. Now we're going to try to access it. Now, of course, while we talk to Larry here, we want to make sure that we know what which which uh, program is not working. So we're going to access that um, access his computer uh, using just over that network using using a file explorer over the network. The way you do that is open a file explorer and just type in backspace or backslash backslash type in kobuman one and then another backslash and then we're going to access his c share drive which is should be enabled by default for your business it may not be but it really should be in, in a, a business type of environment it should let you in you may get a pop-up asking you to log in and that's fine too just use your credentials and if you have access that's great so once we're inside of c right now we're connected to his pc over there you can see that it's on the network connection right here. And then the name of his computer is Kobuman1. And we're inside of his C drive. We're looking at his C drive um, just using a file explorer. So he's using a program, right? He's using a program and we know it's not working. And then we're going to ask him, which program is it, right? And then, of course, since we don't have remote desktop, we can't initiate the repair. Normally, you can just repair the program, and a lot of times that would fix it. You know, uninstall it, reinstall it, and whatnot. But if you don't have that option, or user doesn't, you know, have the admin privileges to do it either, and again, you don't have a remote desktop of any type of software, we're going to try to fix that by going to his local profile. Because in this case, if we go back here, it says nothing happens when he runs the program. So what do you suspect? Suspect? I suspect some kind of configuration issue or just corrupted data or a cache uh, inside of his local profile where the configuration resides. So we're going to go inside of users folder and we're going to look for his local profile. We're going to ask him what is your local profile name? And then he's going to tell you what his local profile name, which is going to be the same thing as his login. So we're going to pretend that his login is B-U-C-O. We're going to go inside of that. And typically, typically configuration data for any type of program that's run, there on, that's run under your local profile is going to be in app data folder. So we're going to click on app data. And then a lot of times it's either going to be in local or roaming. So let's have, let's go into local folder and see what happens so let's say he has problems with adobe we can simply uh, just to kind of clear the catch we can simply rename this folder into adobe old for example and as long as his program is not open it's going to let us rename it like that and this is okay and uh, because when it launches adobe it's going to create a new version of the same folder and just to kind of show you what's inside, we're going to go inside of this. And you can see that if you kind of browse through, you can see that it's either empty. And a lot of times, um, you know, I, I pick this randomly, but there will be some configuration data like config files and this and that. But since it's at the local profile level, it's not necessarily something that's part of the program uh, 
as, as in program that it needs to function, it's something that's created for the local profile as the part of the configuration for that profile. And the same thing happens with anything else. For example, there's Google here. You know, if you go inside a Google here folder, uh, and if you go, you can see that it's a Chrome. And if you go inside of that, you can see there's user data. Again, this is what I talked about. And if you, for example, go to default, you can see that there is a cache data inside of it. And of course, you can find things like, uh, I don't know, their uh, favorites and stuff like that, which is, by the way, missing on this one, uh, but that's okay. So let's stay on track here. Since we messed with Adobe, I'm going to tell them, go ahead and Ado uh, try to open Adobe again. So let's go back to the user's computer. We don't need this window anymore. Actually, I'm just going to, yeah, let's close it. We're going to close it and then we're going to, you know, I'm, I'm, so in this at this point, I'm telling them, okay, go ahead and open Adobe. So he's going to type in Adobe, and then we're going to click Adobe Reader. We can see that Adobe Reader works fine. And let's kind of go back to our computer so we can see again what's going on from our point of view. We are now back at, you know, our point of view as a technician, and we can see that the new folder was created for Adobe, like I stated. So that created new, and you can see that here that the date is 6 10 2020 at 1 p.m. And if you look at the time here, it's 101 p.m. So that means it created just like I said it would. And what that does, it basically resets that program, and a lot of times it actually resolves the issue. All right, now just in case you actually had to go in and change registry settings that's an, uh, that's something you can also do without having to have a remote desktop as long as you have the proper credentials to do so so on your computer on your own computer that you're using your work computer you're going to open up a registry editor and you have to run it as administrator so remember how computer name for this gentleman was Kobelman one here and let's pretend that we have to go into registry and add some kind of a function, some kind of key to make it work. We can do that remotely as well. So we're going to take Kobelman1, which is the name of his computer, and we're going to connect to it over the network registry. So we're going to connect to his registry on his computer over the network. We're going to click network. We're going to put in Kobelman1. We're going to check name to see if we can actually find it on the network. And it usually takes a little bit, it depends, you know, on, on the setup, but you can see that it found it and it's located on this work group. But a lot of times it would just be a domain name which says new server zero. That's actually the name of my work group for my local computers at home, but it will be kind of the same deal when it comes to domain. It will be the main name first, followed by the computer name. So that means it found it, found it. We can click okay. And we are now directly connected into his registry. So let's go ahead and kind of navigate, see if we can find that Adobe. We're going to expand H key local machine. You know, it's a local machine on his computer. We, we are now connected to it. We're going to expand H key local machine. And guess the next thing we're going to do. We're going to use some logic here, guys, and we're going to just go to software. We're going to expand software because we know Adobe is software. Now, there are a couple of different places that it might be depending on whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit software but you can see right away that adobe shows up here so if you expand that you can see that this is actually for premiere pro and after effects so that's not what we're actually worked on we actually worked on adobe uh, dc or adobe reader dc so if we scroll down and expand wow 6432 node which indicates that it's a 32-bit software uh, we can now look for Adobe here and expand that, and we can now see that there is Adobe Reader there, right there. And then if we expand that, there's DC, and inside of that, we can, you know, whatever we need to make changes to, we can now go inside of its uh, remote registry settings and make any changes this, that we want. Once we make these changes, we can immediately ask them to try, ask the user to try to see if the issue was resolved. Okay, now let's look at another example here and another example of a ticket. Of course, finish up noting your ticket. I'm going to add internal note here first. I'm going to say issue resolved by configuration. And then depending on the environment that you work in, you may have to specify what you exactly did. In which case we did, uh, 
um, I don't know, reset config folder data. We're going to save it and then we're going to mark it result completed and that's that. That ticket, oops, that ticket should be now gone out of our system and we're going to now concentrate on this second ticket. All right, let's click on this ticket. This ticket is called I am missing internet shortcuts folder. And then if you look in the descriptions, we can see that it says internet folder is missing from my desktop. So in this case, there is a folder or there was a folder on their desktop that, you know, it was with deleted or just simply gone. Who knows? Maybe it was moved somewhere. That happens sometimes too. User would just accidentally, you know, for example, they would like, if you look at over here, they would drag it somewhere and it would go God knows where, you know. So typically you would say, hey, can you check your recycle bin go inside of your recycle bin and check if it's in there you know this and that and yeah definitely do all of that stuff but if it's not there and you know it's just one of those things that you may have a copy of you know let's say you can't find it and then but you can find a copy of you can ask them hey does anybody else have a copy of it maybe i can copy it over because it's just internet shortcuts we can certainly do that again we're going to have to uh, get some information from them before we can proceed further but we're going to role play and then first thing of course we're going to do assign our ticket assign a ticket to ourselves and then we're going to reply to customer hello this is Irvin with us or you can say tech support doesn't matter you know let's, let's do tech support with tech support or you know you can say help desk you know whatever your situation might be can you please provide your pc name so that i can restore your folder thank you <laughs> thanks Irvin. okay so now user has been asked or you can call them you can talk to them again we're going to go back to the user and you know we're going to get that pc name and in this case we're going to pretend that the same pc name is couple man so we're going to keep doing that the pc let's do this users pc name is couple man one all right so kind of same thing and i'll i'll show you something else just in case this doesn't work uh, we can go back into his uh you know desktop and then we can just copy paste whatever it is that, that they need so let's pretend that uh, actually let's go ahead and just create a quick folder called internet shortcuts or f and now we're just going to copy pasta onto his desktop okay now let's go to his computer now we're at his computer and we can say hey can you please check to see if the internet shortcuts is back and sure enough there it is but what if for some reason just using a pc name doesn't work some, there might be an issue with dns so just type in in cobleman1 and you know go inside of that you know shared drive or shared network connection i should say what if that doesn't work then we're going to have to get an ip address and see how that goes so you can ask them too hey what is your ip address and if they're like uh i don't know uh, you can just ask them okay well can you go command line this and that but that's too complicated so let's go back <laughs> and ask them to give us the ip address without any confusion but but let's see what else we can do you know before we do that let's let's see what else we can do without actually confusing things and confusing the user because we don't we don't want to do that we just want to find that out on our own all right let's go back to our own computer all right so let's say this this wasn't successful and this didn't work and for some reason we can't access it using cobleman one like so let's say that doesn't work let's say we're not able we get an error or it just doesn't you know it just says not found then we're going to find the, in, uh, their ip address and see if that works so of course the first thing we can do is open our command line and do a quick ping we're going to do a quick pingage you're going to type in ping cobleman one 
And here's our result. And guess what it is? It's an IP version 6. <laughs> it's an IP version 6. I, uh, if we do this, it's not going to work. Nothing's going to happen because this uh, systems are not set up to, you know, dooring into a computer. Some people may disagree, but this is what I call backdoor into computer. You can just type in and usually instead of just a, you know, PC name, you just type in the IP address and same deal. Let's see if we can get that C share. Yeah, it's not going to work. So now we need to actually find what the IP version or translated or I guess translated in, in a way, but what we're actually looking for is an equivalent IP version 4 off this IP version 6 uh, IP address. So this is IP version 6 that we're looking at here, but we want to know what the standard is, what the standard IP version 4 is. So let's go back to the user's computer. You can say, hello, sir, can you please tell me what your IP address is? And you can just tell them, uh, can you please go to the search bar and then type in, I don't know, there are a couple of ways of getting to it. I'm just going to tell them to type in network. And then first thing that comes up is network status. And I'm just going to tell them, uh, why don't you go ahead and click on change connection properties. And then if we scroll down, it gives you a bunch of different information. Now here's our IP version 6. Remember, this is our IP version 6 that we tried earlier. And it didn't work. But luckily, we do have equivalent IP version 4, which is right here. And that is 192.168.1.102. All right, let's go back to our computer. All right, now let's try that. So we're going to backslash backslash 192. And you can see that I accessed that before. So 192.168.1.102. And then C dollar sign. Enter. And there it is. Same thing uh, that we can do with, uh, whatchamacallit, same thing we can do with the registry. We can connect to using the IP address. But let's go ahead and take care of this user real quick. We're going to go and copy the Internet Shortcuts folder back into their desktop. And now that we are back at user's computer, now we can see that Internet Shortcut has appeared. Now let's go ahead and do the registry edit thing, reg edit. And then we're going to use that connect network registry. Let me just minimize this stuff real quick here with this so it's out of the way. 192.168.1.102. Okay. And again, it takes just a little bit to kind of figure out what's going on. And now it's actually asking me for login ID. So I'm going to use, typically you can use your domain login but since I'm not on a domain, I'm just going to use a local admin, uh, a local admin ID and password. And there it is. We're back at the same thing, except now we're accessing it using an IP address. So there you have it, guys. There are many, many different ways to deal with this. I uh, these are just the typical ones that I go for when it comes to resolving issues like this real quick whenever I'm working tickets, whenever, you know, I work as a business system analyst, but I do work on tickets, especially nowadays now that we're working from home, so they need more assistance. So this is what I do mostly nowadays, uh, simply because different times, you know, different times, guys. So now I'm just going to finish my ticket here. Made a copy of internet folder to desktop whatever you want to put in there as long as it's and detailed enough so that if somebody looks at it like your boss knows what you did and i'm going to resolve this and mark it complete all right guys if you get one second please click the like button it really means a lot to me that way i know you guys like my stuff and i'll keep making more videos because of that thank you so much and let's get into it. All right, guys, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this video. Windows updates. What do we need to know about Windows updates? Let's have a look on Windows updates, how they look like on your computer. I'm sure you already know this, but this is how you get to them. If you click on the start button and then click settings, 
and then if you click update and security and that's just one way of getting to windows updates so this is what you see nowadays this is, has changed a lot from windows 7 and it kind of looks like this now where it gives you a little bit more options right now i have paused windows updates and for the right reasons because i wanted to show you uh, how it looks like when it starts updating in case you're not aware most of you i'm sure have seen this happen on your computer but a lot of times it just happens in the background and it just kind of does its thing so here's an example of security intelligence update here for microsoft defender antivirus so what that was actually was an update for your built-in windows antivirus software and we could we saw that what they called a kb which is a knowledge base article about that Here's another one here, and this one is a update for Windows 10 version 19.09 for X64 based system. And here's the KB number for it. So, so KB, we're going to copy this KB, the whole thing. So it's KB4497165. And then we're going to look it up on the internet to see exactly what this is. But we can tell kind of here what it might be kind of in just general so it's kind of vague right now all it tells us it's update from windows 10 version 1909 and down here you can see that it's a fairly large uh, or an important update that it requires a restart so there's a pop-up here that says restart and of course we have a you know big old restart button here so let's kind of dig into this version 1909 why does it say version 1909 well let's see what our windows version is so if you go to search button and just type in w-i-n-v-r v-e-r i'm sorry so if you hit enter it gives you the windows version so here it is it's our version 1909 microsoft version 1909 and again it's pretty vague and it just tells us that it is update for that specific os build so it's uh, Windows uh, version 1909. All right, so if you do me a favor and pause the video here and kind of check which version you have on your computer, and I'm really curious to which version you guys are using, you'd be surprised. I bet some of you have a version like 1809 or even something else. Let me know in the comments. I'm really curious about that. All right, so we have copied our KB. Now we're going to open up, let me see here, you know what let's just open edge see if it works i've actually seen edge work sometimes and sometimes it doesn't sometimes it just crashes out of the blue but that's okay we're going to just open it up and we're going to go to googleage and search for our knowledge article is what i call them um don't know exactly what they would call it hey there is no connectivity which is really really surprising because i know i do have connectivity huh cannot connect securely to this page well there it is that was really bizarre guys i'm not sure it could be my internet that is causing this issue although i did get a new modem just literally last week maybe it's my router maybe i need to change some uh, router setting so here here's our uh KB here and it's 4497165 let's see if it refers to that 4497165 we have double checked that and here is a knowledge article from Microsoft here it is it's a Intel microcode updates and now we can kind of dig into this and kind of see what this is about again this is good to know for somebody who is working desktop support before you push these type of updates to all the computers in the environment or a business environment so let's look at what kind of it's in what this is about from top to bottom so you can see that it's an article and that there is the title of it and it says here applies to Windows Server applies to Windows Server version 1903 all editions Windows 10 uh, version 1903 all editions Windows Server and Windows version 1909 and then all editions and then there is more so basically it's an update for all versions of Windows that are 1903 through 1909 okay and in the summary it says it, you know basically it's a description of it and it's an upgrade it's an update to intel microcode for the following products of cpus basically is what they're talking about so here are different types of cpus these are all different types of intel 
CPUs, and that's what the update is for. So it's we got Denverton, Sandy Bridge, Sandy Bridge E, Valley View, Whiskey Lake U, and then there's these other ones. We got Haswells, Haswell desktops, a lot of server type of stuff. So in the nutshell, this article tells us a lot more information than what we see here in just a basic kind of title of Windows updates. And as desktop support, you want to look and read this whole thing, the whole thing before you actually decide to push this update. And of course, you want to test it in a business type of in, in environment. And basically, you want to test it on a computer that you have like in a lab that you're testing before you, you know, push these. It's probably okay, you know, these are all just you know, just a microcode update for, you know, CPUs. And they've obviously they've been tested by Microsoft before they decided to update. But this is the same type of thing you have to do as somebody who does desktop support as well. So that's a, a one important thing. This example just happened to be this microcode update. And it's a good example because you don't want to like, you know, you don't want to brick all your system by installing a new microcode on your computer. But let's kind of look at an update history so we can look at another example of a Windows update. All right, so I'm going to close this. We're going to restart a little bit later, but I first want to show you this other. Hey guys, I'm sorry to interrupt the video here, but I just want to pause it real quick and just kind of clarify that where I'm going right now is a place where Windows updates can be removed. The reason I'm going to this tab or this area is because it's easier to kind of talk about installed updates that are already on there. However, if you want to see the full history of updates on this computer, you can just kind of pay attention to this arrow that is pointing to that. So we wouldn't necessarily go anywhere else from this tab if you just want to see the updates that are on there. You know, some updates are not removable, but the page I'm going to are the ones that you can remove them. Uh, type of Windows update. So to see those, we actually have to go to Apps and Features. So I'm going to right click our little Start button here. We're going to click Apps and Features. And it's not going to be here. We're going to have to go to our other old school type of uh, add remove software or program that you have probably are familiar from Windows 7 and older operating system. So right here, we're going to actually click on programs and features. This is going to take us to a place that gives us a lot more details of what it's installed. And I personally like it better because it's kind of a smaller font. It's more compact and you can see a lot more. So this is a typical place where you would see all the things that are installed on your computer, whether it's just some programs, some distributable packages, you know, everything that you've pretty much installed manually and things that have installed automatically. But that's not exactly what we are looking for here. We were looking for actual updates. And that is actually located right here, right above turn on Windows features on and off. There's a button called View Installed Updates. So we're going to select that and check it out. Now I'm going to kind of move this around a little bit here so I can show you something very interesting. I'm going to squeeze this here. Oh, okay, that's good enough. So I wanted to show you, remember the uh, KB that we looked at first? It was KB4497165. Well, here it is. It's actually here on the bottom. And on the right side here, if you notice, there is no installed on date. So there is the installed on column. And there's no install on date because we still haven't rebooted here. We're still waiting for it to actually fully install. And once that's done, we're going to have the actual installed on date here. And the reason I'm telling you this is because this is what this is the uh, order uh, that it's um, sorted out by default. So once you open this, the bottom one is always going to be the most current, most current uh, Windows update. So we're going to start looking from the top, and that's the first thing that in, was installed. And it was uh, on June 18, 2018, and the first thing that got installed was KB2565063, which is just basically a Microsoft Visual C++ 2010 redistributable. So what that is, it's just a package that you that is required to run a certain program. Some programs require this, and this is what that is. It's kind of self-explanatory. We can look it up just to confirm. So it's 2565063. Let's go back to our Google. 
I'm going to type in two five six two five six zero six three. Is that what it was? That's right. Two five six five zero six three. Two five six five zero six three. And here it is, the first update for Microsoft Windows. And it's very vague. We don't know what this is. So this is our good opportunity to figure out what that is. So it's KB4556799. All right, let's see. 455. See, my short-term memory. It's really early in the morning, so I can't <laughs> exactly sometimes. 6799. 6799. I had my coffee, but my short memory is not that great. So let's see here again. Uh, March March twelfth, that's when it was created, and it's four five five six seven nine nine. We're going to click on that. I'm going to move it up here and see what that is. All right. So here's a, here it is. It's kind of the same thing. We can see here what it applies to again, and uh, you can certainly read that as well. And you can see the actual release date on it. My computer got it, let's see here, eight days later. Did I say March? I'm sorry, it was actually May that it installed on. <laughs> um, now, this one is actually also vague, which is kind of very disappointing. I wish we could get more information on this. But if we scroll down and we can see that there are highlights for this knowledge base article and all it is, it, it just tells us that it's updates to improve security when using Internet Explorer and Microsoft Edge. Updates to improve security when using input devices and updates to verify user password. So these are just regular updates to the basically kind of security settings that are kind of used in Windows operating system. And you can see how it goes on. Improve security when using Microsoft Xbox, Windows, uh, improve security on Windows perform basic operations. So these are just regular things that they keep updating to kind of make sure that everything stays secure on your computer. And that's what this update is about. It's very vague. It's not a like critical update or anything like that. It's just something that they keep doing and doing to kind of improve things on the operating system. So here's a security update that I wanted to show you and it's KB4552152152. Uh, Let me see if I can remember that. 21552. Nope. I need more coffee, guys. 45521. Two one five two. Okay, there it is. All right, so we're going to click on this one. There it is, four five five two one five two. And again, we can go through this and verify what it is. And this update makes a call the promise to service stack, which is the components that installs Windows updates. So this is an update to Windows update. <laughs> okay, all right, sure. And it's labeled a security update. All right. I mean, I'm not sure about these labelings that they're using at this point. But the point is of this whole video is that you want to look up and find out as much information about any Windows updates before you push them to mass computers and definitely want to test them out. <laughs> There's not much we can do when it comes to kind of digging really deep into this and looking at the code and this and that and when it comes down to it it's up to it's up to uh, Microsoft to share this information and it again this is kind of disappointing but it is very very vague very vague um, when you do desktop support you will have control of which updates are installed at which times and you know this and that which is a great thing otherwise I'm not sure how how else you could deal with this now when it comes to these type of updates Microsoft is 100% in control and and when it comes to what they are actually working on and what they're fixing and you as somebody who does desktop support would just have to make sure that they're safe and you would have to do some testing before you actually deploy them and that can take sometimes up to a month or even more depending what the update is but you definitely want to figure out as much as possible what it's about and do extensive testing when it comes to some of this stuff and yes i know most of these things you can just literally 
you know, just install and test it. If it's a minor update or it's just update, you know, this and that, you still don't want to like install it and say, hey, it works fine on this computer. No, you want to kind of hang in there for at least a week, I want to say, with some computers being used, actively used to see if everything is okay, just to make sure that that is cool. All right, guys, so here's our resume template. There will be a link in the description for this if you're interested. This is based off a resume that I've used before and got jobs. So this is something from 2013. Since I've had good luck with it, I'm going to use this as a template and kind of modify it. I have removed a bunch of stuff, a bunch of uh, personal information that I didn't want to share, obviously, but the gist of it is here. It was a one page, and the one pager, in my opinion, is the best because, you know, employer doesn't necessarily want to read through all of that stuff. So we're going to modify it from top down. I'm going to read the things that are in the boxes here and for each uh, category here that I have. And then we're going to delete it and kind of provide or insert your own. I'm going to teach you how to do it. And we're going to use the template that is that is available to us right now. So the first thing you want to see and you want to type is your name. So I'm just going to type in Irvin D. You want to spell out your whole name there. I'm just putting D because, you know, I want to stay private as much as I can. And then you can change the font. You can see that the font here is actually 22. You can play around with this a little bit. I wouldn't go less than 18 or uh, what is it that I changed it to 18 and because you want the employer to kind of see your resume right away. All right. The next thing it says here, it's address. I actually typed in address there, just the word address, but you want to type in your own address. So if you're following along with this template, just type in your address. I'm just going to pretend like this is my address, Lakeview Drive, which is not my address, by the way. And I'm just going to type in St. Louis, Missouri, 63, I don't know, 555, whatever. So type in your address. And then here it says cell phone. Most people have cell phones. Or if you have a home phone, you can replace this with home. But otherwise, you just type in your phone number. So I'm just going to type in my cell phone number. And you do the same thing. And then here for the email address, whatever that is, you just type it in as well. Very simple. The reason you want this is, let's say you go for an interview and then a week or two passes by, which is normal because the employer goes through so many applicants. But then they go, they know once they're done interviewing all the people, they may say, hey, I kind of like that Irving guy. So they go through and they go through all of these resumes and you want them to see your name first. That you want them to find them as quickly as possible. You want them to be. You want this to be your the first your cell phone and your email address. Okay, that's the whole point of having it like this. Admittedly, this style of resume is a little bit old. As you can see, it's from 2013. But I'm using this because this is what I used to get this job uh, back in the day. I don't see why you would want to change the style anyway uh, from this. But the reason. And another reason for me to actually use this is because the way the information is laid out on a single page and it works. You want it to be, you know, something that potential employer can just read and get right away and get hooked into it because you really want to hook them into that. Okay, so I'm going to read what's in my profile summary as an example. Again, make sure you don't necessarily use everything that I have on here. Please do not just use this as your own experience, please. Just modify your own and because uh, you want to be honest on a resume. Okay. So that being out of the way, let's go ahead and read what I had in here back in 2013. So it says here, in search of challenging career in IT field, I will further expand my professional experience. So that's kind of an intro there for that. And then I proceed to say, professional experience that I have acquired as a business system analyst, system administrator, desktop support, and working telecom field monitoring activity for eight years. You see what I kind of did there? I tell them, this is my professional experience. You know, I'm telling them right away, I work as a business system analyst, system administrator, desktop support, and working in telecom field monitoring activity for eight years. Now, the reason this is kind of word wordy here is because what this is is actually me working as a fraud analyst, and that entailed me monitoring network traffic over the phone lines and trunk lines uh, for the uh, for the for the company that I worked for. So I had to word it in a such way where it's relevant to the job that I'm applying for. 
So keep in mind, every time you make a resume, you want to tailor it specifically to that job. So you want to mention things here that are related to that. So that way you can sell yourself to the, to the employer. You want to tell them, hey, I have specific experience at that. And we'll get to that as well here in a moment. Moving on, it says here, my dedication to employers shown by my ability to quickly adapt and execute tasks at hand. So that's fine. You're basically telling them, I am really good at adapting. I can learn new things and then I can execute those things really good, you know, or really fast. And then you can change that to your liking as well. So here, so if you want, you know, once you're you know, playing around with my template, you're going to have this in here. Just if you want to just change it to something, but just word it differently. Make sure it's not word for word because, you know, it's plagiarism. But <laughs> I'm not going to hold you on onto that, though. I don't, you know, just make sure it's not the same thing. Just You can word it in your own way. This is why I'm leaving it like this. And the next thing it says, I have gone through numerous and challenging tasks that required fast learning creativity as part of frequent transitioning testing of new equipment, software, and network systems. So you further are talking about yourself and trying to tell them, hey, I am really good at doing all of these things, you know. Of course, you can go through here and change it to whatever you actually did and, you know, that because, you know, you can't just reword it like this one here. You have to literally this one, tailor this one to your actual experience. So don't reword this one and just put your own experience there. And we can modify that there. And the last thing you want, and which is kind of what I, it's like an open end here. And it says, I have a specific and then what you actually want to do here is say, I have specific experience working on this system or working this job. And then you specify, then you specify something super related and exactly related to this job. Basically, you're telling them, hey, I'm the guy for this job. You know, I'm the guy for this job. All right. Now, that kind of covers that. You guys can fill in your own thing there, modify it, whatever your experience may be. However, I do want to touch on this far, first part of it here where it says, in search of a challenging career in IT field, that will further expand my professional experience. It kind of sounds fake, to be honest. So I'm going to delete that. And then what I'm going to do actually here is move this part of it to the front. I'm going to cut this. And I'm going to move this part of it because I feel like times have changed. And, you know, depending on time of the year when you're looking for a job, if there are more applicants, then you, competition is going to be more fierce. So if you if the first thing is that you put on your resume, I have specific experience working this job or this system or whatever you want. That's the first thing, in my opinion, that you should have on there because that's the first thing they read. OK, so. And then. We can you can modify again this here which says professional experience that I have acquired. You can word this any way you want. Just make sure you provide what is it that you worked for. So let's go ahead and delete this part of this and I just say, I don't know, help desk. Uh, did you work desktop support? I don't know. Call center rep. You know, because you could be applying for help desk. You can put down, I worked as a call center rep. That's relevant. You know, it's not necessarily IT but it's definitely irrelevant. You're really good at customer service. As a matter of fact, you can just put down customer service, rep, or whatever is it that you, you know, worked. And then if you are somebody who's coming out of, uh, if you're somebody who's coming out of school, you can say, um, instead of, uh, let me just kind of backtrack here a little bit. If you have, if you're just coming out of school, you can say, I have specific, let's see here, working experience for this job acquired from school training. You know, you can specify that. So if you're coming out of school, you want to specify something like this. So to tell them, Hey, yes, I'm just out of school. I literally just got my degree. I got my certificate. But you can word it in a sense where it just says, I, I know how to do this stuff. So that's what you want to tell them there. Okay. Now, let's see. Where did we get to? Okay, we were filling out this customer service rep. So, yeah, again, fill this up with 
any additional uh, per, uh, any additional experience that you may have. And then we have this my dedication to employers shown by ability quickly adapt to execute tasks at hand. Again, reword this. Feel free to just reword this to your own liking. I have gone through numerous challenges that requires fast learning and creativity as part of frequent transitioning quest, you know, transitioning testing of new equipment, software, and network systems. So this is specific to me, but you can modify this to uh, this, for example, that required, let's do this, fast deployment of new OS builds. So I'm just throwing examples in here. Uh, I have I have gone through numerous challenges that require a fast deployment of OS builds, and this could be true in school too. You know, maybe you you gone through this type of training in school as well, or you can put down. I have gone through numerous challenges that required fast thinking, fast thinking, and problem solving. You know. So, again, you, you can modify to your own. I'm just kind of throwing you ideas out there and feel free to, you know, just edit this template to your own liking. All right, let's move on to technical skills. All right, so technical skills. What you want to put down is simply technical skills, basically things that you worked on that you can think of. There are so many things, and you can go about it different ways, but what I like to do here, and I think this is still pretty good, you can list operating systems. And I kind of filled it in a little bit here to save time in the video, but what I added after I modified my uh, resume, I added Windows 10, Windows 8, Windows 7, and you can go as far back as, as you want. And that kind of kind of lists the things that uh, you're, you've touched on at least at some point, you know? And then you can just basically list all the operating systems that you're familiar with. This is kind of self explanatory planetary but be honest you can see here that i put down windows server 2018 uh, 2003 2008 and 2012 as working knowledge so back in the day i you know and 2013 literally here i didn't really have that much experience with windows server or i wasn't that knowledgeable which has changed over time and of course you can modify this you know like so so 2016 2019 I think that's the current one and then I'm going to delete this working knowledge because I'm actually pretty uh, per, you know proficient proficient um, in these uh, servers now so Linux web server configuration so I'm just going to Linux you know what I'm just gonna type in lamp server configuration that's basically for you know web server installation linux based and yeah again just modify make sure you're honest about this because they will ask you about it and if you don't know how to answer any of these things that you're listing then you're basically screwed uh, excuse my uh, lack of better words uh, if once they figure out that you're basically bsing here then, then you know, you wasted everybody's time, and you're not gonna get that job. And then I next thing I have is software. And then you can list all kinds of different softwares that you worked on. Everything that you can think of, just list it in there. Don't get into detail. Literally, just list the names like I did here. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There are so many, so many different things. If I were to actually start adding this, there would be quite a bit more. So I'm, I just kind of left it at that of the things that I could remember. But uh, yeah, I mean, if, <laughs> if you look at some of my videos, you can see that I've worked on many different things. Oh, yeah, I forgot to put AWS and Google. See, now I'm just showing off. I'm sorry, guys. Google Cloud. Oh, what's the Azure? Anyways, you guys get the idea uh, and just kind of fill it out to the best of your knowledge. Make sure if, if it's very little, just make sure that that you probably forgot some things. You know, you'd be surprised, but keep thinking of things that are relevant to that job. Do you think at that job people are working on, you know, are they like, what kind of environment is it? Is it office environment? Then you might want to 
you know, list office. So this is outdated, Office 2000. <laughs> anyways, make sure that's updated. This is really outdated. Uh, anyways, I'm not going to start listing different offices because you know that uh, you just got to make sure you update all of that. And then I've got some networking here. If it's related to... Um, uh, see, I would actually name the, rename this probably here. Or maybe just leave it there. I'm, I'm trying to think why I named it just networking. Because there are some of these things that are very specific here. Anyways, if you want to leave it as networking here, I believe that's completely fine. Uh, the first part of this resume is, is something that's going to hook them up. Once they start reading all your experience here, they're just going to be like, oh, yeah, he knows a bunch of stuff. You know what I mean? So list all the things that are related to that. And you can change this to something else. If the job is, I don't know, let's change this to help desk because I know a lot of people that watch my video are help desk guys. You can start list, listening all the things that you used, listing things that you've used uh, when working on help desk. And you can start listing like ticketing systems and different tools that you've used in here and this and that. So let's, for example, type in just like Jira ticketing system, right? Or um, I already have Actor Directory, user accounts, GPO, remote desktop, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. See, the, if you're, let's see here, I'm just going to, let's do this here. This is kind of what a help desk might look like. You want to have actor, director, user accounts on there as a first thing because you do that a lot on desktop support or desktop, desktop support, but um, more and more so a help desk type of thing. And then list all the things that you would kind of do as a help desk guy, you know. So start listing all those things and that should be enough. So the next thing we have here is a professional experience so simply put this is your experience as the experience that you have whatever that might be in my example you can see here that i have from january 2030 the third to current is what i have filled out here and it says on-site and user support troubleshooting uh, general and proprietary applications and I've modified this so that way it's related to literally like a desktop support or a help desk type of a, a job but more so towards a desktop support and then I have 24 7 on call support for major system outages this is what my kind of my current job is at the moment uh, but and then PC image encryption software actor directory VoIP system troubleshooting project managers product impact analysis but in reality Right now, I'm kind of mostly just doing help desk type of stuff because we're working from home and we're no longer on site. So you would, and then of course you'd want to put your title in there and I'm going to type in business systems analyst and I'm going to tab this over so it looks neater. I'm going to remove this part of it. And you can you can make slight changes here and there to look so it looks a little bit neater. And then of course, if possible, uh, you can list second job. So let's kind of pretend that I'm that I have help desk, which I do. I don't know why I said pretend. <laughs> help desk experience. Matter of fact, you know what? Let's let's do this. Because I think some of you, I think, and I forgive me if I am jumping to conclusion, but I think some of you may have call center experience. So let's pretend that it's that. And then you describe what you did in your call center job. So, you know, take, I'm going to change that. Take inbound calls from customers. Enter, resolve customer issues related to, and then you specify that, and then basically describe everything that you've done, you know. So I'm just using this as an example. And um, if you are kind of like, if you kind of want to 
put in things that, that if you like let's say you don't have enough stuff to put in here you can literally list down things that you've got like a, an award for you know you can say uh, call center rep of the month award you know stuff like that if you need things to fill in just think of all the things that may have happened some good things that have happened during that job anything to just kind of make yourself look good and that describes the job you have done and I'm not too stressed out about this previous job here because the most recent job might be the most relevant job this is kind of the main thing that they would read this is just kind of a secondary type of thing if this is your uh, if the, if this is your main thing, if this is your uh, the only job that you have, then you might want to spend more time on it and describe what it is it that you've done in there. Make sure that comes across really well, because and and if you have to make it so that it's relevant to the job that you're applying for. Again, I can't stress this enough. Don't lie on any of this stuff. Please don't lie. Okay, moving on. And it's simple, very simple. The last part of it is just education. Just kind of list down here. Oh, I need to change this here real quick. Down here, list real quick what kind of education you have. Let's say you have A plus certification. Let's see, I don't know. Did I spell certification right now? I didn't. You can say associate degree in, I don't know, let's say in business. Or you can say, I mean, it doesn't matter that you've got a degree in business. You can still get these type of jobs if you want to switch over to doing help desk and work on computers. Whatever degree that you have, make sure you list it. But you can, you know, say whatever that is, associate degree in, let's say, I don't know, networking or whatever that might be. And then you have to provide location. So let's say St. Louis, Missouri, and then name of the college, for example, uh, I don't know, MSU or whatever the name of the college is, institution, or whatever it is, just list it there. This is very simple, last type of thing. So guys, this is the template I've used to get many interviews and my current job as well as business system analyst. So I hope this helps you. I know it's really hard to create a, in a, in a, a resume, but as long as you tailor it to the job that you're applying for and I don't mean again don't lie but make sure you sh you tell them that you have that specific experience so once you go go through and look for jobs look for the ones that you can do don't apply for jobs that you can't do that's just not it's not gonna work and it's not right either it's not it's not honest so yeah feel free to take all of this stuff reword things that that are going to help you, that are going to help you in, in, in some ways, but please don't, like for example, use the exact same things that I've typed in here. So just make sure you use your own. This is why I'm not gonna leave it as just a, you know, empty template with, you know, things that says operating system and then there's nothing in here. I'm gonna leave it as it is, so that guys, so that way you guys can change it to your own way. All right. Again, please use your own stuff on here. And I wish you best of luck, guys. Make sure you do a lot of research before you apply for any of the jobs. If you need interview training, God knows I have videos on that. I have top 20 desktop support interview questions and answers. I have top help desk interview questions and answers. I have top system administrator interview questions and answers. Top network administrator interview questions and answers. I have all of this stuff. On my channel so if you want if you want to go to my channel youtube.com forward slash kobo man and click on the search box it's kind of underneath the 
the uh, the image there, like the front image, the, and with a logo and stuff like there is a search box in there, and just type in desktop support. Matter of fact, if you go to youtube.com and just type in desktop support, interview questions and answers, my video is going to show up. Or help desk interview questions and answers, my videos are going to show up. Just look, just click on the video that says Kobo Man. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I wish you best of luck and take care. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In this video, I will teach you how to handle help desk calls. It's going to be very simple to follow. I have broken this down into five simple steps for you to learn. Number one is readiness. Number two is customer service. Number three is knowledge. Number four is efficiency. And number five is closing. All of these steps are incredibly important and are crucial to know in order to be best at help desk. Friends, if you have a second to click that like button, I really appreciate it. That way I don't have to bug you with any ads at this point. It really makes a huge difference for my channel. Thank you so much and let's get into it. As a quick summary, what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you and go through all of these steps with you, explain to you what I mean with each one of those steps, and then I'm going to show you an example phone call that I will make that is going to give in a really good example on how you should be handling calls. And although requirements for the company you work for may be slightly different or have specific requirements, you can certainly take that and adjust this format to that. This way you have a base to work with and you have experience on knowing how to do the call. All you got to do is just make simple adjustments according to what the company or your employer wants. Number one, readiness. This simply means that you should be ready to take the call at any moment. The best way to go about this is to pull up all the systems that you are going to use throughout the day. For example, let's say you are doing a help desk and the majority of the day is people calling in to reset the passwords. Well, you should have that system up and logged into at any time, whether it's Active Directory or some kind of proprietary system that the business you work for gives you access to. So you should have that ready. Got to be ready to take the call at any time. Pull up the systems, be ready to take that call. This will make it a lot easier for you to do your job. And number two, we have customer service. Customer service is incredibly important. You got to be ready to show some kind of professionalism when answering calls. It's not as simple as saying hello and then the other person on the other line has to guess whether they got the right number or not. You got to be ready with good to customer service by introducing yourself, making sure that you're polite. You don't have to be overly polite. It is just basic customer service. This is not a sales line or anything like that. You just have to have basic customer service to show that you're a professional and that you are friendly and polite. This is incredibly important, especially if you're working as a contractor for somebody and the client wants that type of service. Trust me, they're going to review your calls and if you don't have good customer service, you're going to be in trouble. But don't worry, I will show you a really good example on how to do this. And number three, we have knowledge. Once you have good knowledge, it's going to be a lot easier to handle any call that comes through. This way, you don't have to struggle into trying to figure out what the problem is. It's one thing to reset passwords because it's simple type and click. While, on the other hand, if you don't know how to resolve computer issues, you may have a hard time in handling any calls, let alone health desk calls. So it's incredibly important to educate yourself as much as you can with any resources that you have. One example of the resources is my channel. I have a list of help desk guides that you can check out. There's a link in the description. I will also try to put a link that pops up there if you want to check that out. But either way, learn as much as you can about technology so that way you can resolve issues in an efficient manner, which leads me to number four, which is efficiency. Efficiency ties in with everything that I've talked about so far. Readiness, customer service, and knowledge. Once you have all three of those things down, you should have the efficiency down easily. So the main thing in this course is to learn the first three things of this and then the efficiency just comes by itself. All right, now let's the last part and that is closing. At number five, we have closing and for the right reason. Once you resolve issues, you want to have a really nice closing and that is reflected in the way you greet the customer at the end. You want to make sure that the customer or user has a good experience when it comes to calling help desk. You want to make sure that they're comfortable calling the help desk. And that, of course, is part of the customer service, but the customer service is not there just throughout the call. 
but at the end of the call as well. And now it's time for our mock-up call. What I'm going to show you is an example on how to handle a help desk call in a professional manner. Make sure you watch the whole thing, and if you like it, please show what they think. All right, let's do it. Thank you for calling Tech Support. My name is Irvin. Uh, what can I assist you with today? Hi, I, uh, I, I, for some reason, I can't log in to Outlook. Outlook keeps asking me for a password. I don't know why. I, uh, I'm not sure what's going on here. Sure. Does it, um, does it uh, give you an issue whenever you try to log in anything else, or is this just this specific system? Uh, let me, let me try. I, I think it's just Outlook, but. I'm not sure. I don't even know why Outlook keeps asking me for the password, but I think it's just Outlook. Let me try something else. Oh yeah, yeah. This, um, oh yeah, this other system is also giving me problems. It keeps asking for the password. I don't know why. I did have a little trouble. Uh, like I may have like mistyped the password this morning. Okay. Well, no problem. Let times. me uh, let me look up your account. Uh, what is your login ID for this? My login ID is Irvin underscore uh, C A N. Okay. All right. I got it pulled up here. Okay. Yeah. It does show. It does show you're locked out. Uh, and I do show that it happened around 10 a.m. this morning. Oh. Oh yeah. So. I, oh man. Okay. Yeah. I. I think. Yeah. At that, that time, I tried to log in few times into the computer but it it wouldn't take my password I, I i recently changed it i think i changed it like a couple of days ago so i may have mistyped it a couple of times is that why oh yeah that makes sense so happening? Uh, if, if you mistype password once you don't want to keep trying it usually it locks out after you try more than three times uh but it's not a problem i can unlock you uh would you like me to reset the password as well or do you just uh, want to give it a shot without me resetting if you it? can uh if you can unlock me that would be great i'd like to see if i can uh because i don't feel like changing the password again you know how it is it's like you, you try to like come up with a new password and then it, it's like you're just sitting there trying to figure out well which one do i want to use this time like you know so uh, yeah if you can just unlock me that would be great okay no problem i uh i have it unlocked right now i want to want to give it a shot and see if it works all right hold on let me uh let me try this here okay i i think i'm good now outlook came up now and it's uh okay it looks yeah okay my new <laughs> emails are coming through so okay great uh, that's good i I uh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right, no problem, no problem. I'm I'm glad to help. I'm glad that worked out for you. Uh, is there anything else I can help you with today? No, that is all. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you for calling Tech Support. You have a wonderful day. You too. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you find it educational and useful. I hope it helps you get a job. That's kind of important as well. If you have a moment, please share this video with your friends. Leave a like or ask me any questions that you have in the comments below. And as always, for more help desk stuff, check out my channel. And in the description is a link to all the help desk guides that I have. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate you, and you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kubelman. And today's video is about a ticket that came through our system, and it's going to be about email. Email is very important, and yes, a lot of businesses use Microsoft products for email, but a lot of businesses are actually switching over to web-based services like Gmail, which is pretty normal. And the issue I'm going to talk about is something that comes up a lot for me. I've seen it a lot of times, and this is something you're going to see a lot in Help Desk with any company that has switched over to using Gmail for an example. But then again, if they're switched over to using some other web-based system, chances are that the issue could be resolved the same way as I'm going to show you in this video. Guys, please take one second to like this video. I really appreciate it. It really helps pushes the video forward. And just so you know, if you subscribe, Pretty soon I will have a crash course about tickets. So this crash course is going to be a lot of examples with tickets and we're going to I'm going to show you how to work those tickets and it's going to be a really good video for you to watch. All right, let's get into this one.
So here we are in our ticketing system. If you're not familiar on how to use ticketing systems or just want to know how ticketing systems work, I have a specific video on that. I'll try to remember to put, put a, a pop-up up here so you can check it out and at the end of the video as well. But in this case, we're using a Jira service desk ticketing system as an example. Keep in mind, every company is going to have a very similar system in when, which they use in order to track tickets and work tickets. So here's our first ticket that we're seeing here. We're going to click on it. It's going to be related to exactly what I mentioned earlier. We can see it's from Mike Moser. And Mike said, my Gmail is not working. I can see my old emails, but no emails come through, nor can I send emails to people. Uh, we're going to definitely check, take a look at that, but first thing we got to do is assign the ticket to ourselves. So if we come over here, assign it to ourselves, that way we want to make sure we are actually spend time on it and, um, not, and, and work it while we have it assigned to ourselves. We don't want to work a ticket that somebody else picks up. So that's very important. It says, my Gmail is not working. I can see, I can see my old emails, but no emails come through, nor can I send emails to people. And there is a screenshot. We're going to click on the screenshot. And our screenshot literally says not connected, connecting in one second. Or you can click try now. So the error is not connecting. And uh, it's going to retry automatically. I've seen this quite a lot. So this is something you can definitely going to see a lot in a, in a business type of environment that uses Gmail. And it says here, message could not be sent. Check your network and try again. Again, I want to kind of uh, stress this real quick is that a lot of businesses will be using a web-based email system nowadays. Yes, you can, uh, a lot of businesses are going to be using office product like Outlook and I have videos on that as well, but a lot of businesses are switching over to using web-based system and in this case, it's Gmail. It's perfectly normal for a large company to be using Gmail nowadays. So this is something you will expect. Now back to our screenshot that we hear, that we see here says not connected, connecting in one second. So logically thinking, it's a connection issue, right? Because literally says connected. This is a something that as, as somebody who does uh, PC troubleshooting, computer troubleshooting, you look at the error specifically, and then you are kind of deducting from that what to what might be the issue. And it says here, message could not be sent. Remember he said message could not be sent. Check your network and try again. Logically speaking, again, connection issue, network. So the first thing you would say to him or ask the customer, hey, do you have network connection? Do you have internet connection if they're working from home? Do you have network connection? And that's logical way of going about this. However, I specifically know that this issue is not necessarily re related to their local network connection. It's a connection issue related to connecting to Gmail server or the email server in this case. So this is something that's resolved quite differently. And if you ask the user or if you log into their computer or let's say you remote desktop into their computer and you check their network settings and everything looks fine, then you're going to be confused. But I specifically know how to fix this one. So there are a couple of ways of going about this. If you're remoted in, if you're, if you're using a remote desktop and you're inside of their computer, you can simply go to Google and go to Gmail, and then Gmail is going to load up. And sure enough, when it, it doesn't usually happen, that error usually doesn't pop up or like around here right away, but it does pop up whenever they try to send something. So everything is going to look fine. They're going to see their old emails in here, and then they, they can browse everything. They can click on something, and, you know, that's all great and fine, but they still get that error. So there are a couple of ways of doing this. There is a temporary solution, and the temporary solution to this error is actually to do this. If you go back or reload the page, so if I go to back to if I go to google.com, which I am already there, but I'm just going to do it again, google.com, and you can tell them click on Gmail, and then see on the bottom here it says load basic HTML. Click on that. See, I missed it because I wasn't quick enough. So let me go back here, real quick. I'm going to click Gmail, and then I'm going to have to catch it. Load basic HTML. See, I missed it because it loads so fast. Chances are the business environment it's not going to load that fast. Let me see if I can catch it this time. Come on, load basic G, there it is. So 
once you load a base fancy GUI action that you're seeing, uh, it's going to work fine. And but the user is going to be like, well, what's going on? It looks totally different. And then you can simply click switch to standard view. It's going to go back to the old one. And it's actually going to start working fine. But it's a temporary solution because the issue, this issue specifically is related to some kind of a catch data action that's going on in the background. So it's not, if we go back to here and look at this screenshot, it's not connecting and it says check your network and it keeps retrying and retrying especially whenever he tries to send something it's a configuration issue related to being able to connect to gmail server however that configuration resides on our local computer so what happens is when we clicked on load basic html earlier it flushed that and it switched over to the different server that handles basic HTML version of it. So it temporarily fixes it like that when you switch back to normal one, but it's going to revert to using that old configuration information. So there are a couple of ways of doing about it. If you have a single sign-on type of a setup in a business environment, which means that users use their domain login typically for every system that they log in, you can simply reset that or you can reset their um, or you can reset their uh, Google or Chrome if they're using Chrome you can reset their Chrome profile so if you see it here if you right click on the little icon here and then it's, you can see that there is a Google profile right there and you can turn on sync this and that but if you click on sign out and create a new one basically refresh it this would also resolve the issue I don't like to do it like that because I like to kind of get into it, uh, like kind of like get my feet in there and exactly to exactly where this actual profile is. So this is what I'm going to show you now. If you open up your file explorer, I'm going to minimize this here, and if you go to the root of C, and you go to the users profile, users folder, and you ask them, well, what is your login ID for your domain? And they tell you my login ID is this and that, and then that that will tell you what their local login ID profile name is. So let's say their login account is B U C O. He says my login ID is B U C O. This is where we're going to concentrate on if you're, for example, accessing this over the network or if you're on their. PC, literally looking at their local profile. But you could do this over the network. Um, I've shown this in my previous video if you want to check it out on how to do this without RDP at all. And then we're going to go into app data. If, if app data is not showing, you see how it kind of looks like uh, as if it was a cut? Like if you right click and you cut the folder, that's how it looks like. It kind of looks faded folder. That's because it's usually a hidden folder. If you don't see it, uh, you have to just select on show hidden folders and then you can do that if you click on view or click hidden items right here so if I do that it goes away and if I do that it comes back so if you can't see it it's definitely there or you can simply just type it in app data which is where we're going to it's the same thing as if I was to click on it so again we're looking at this time at this point we're looking for configuration data for that Google Chrome email that we're working with here. So we're going to look to see where this email data and configuration data is located at specifically for Chrome. That's going to be in local. So if you click on the local profile and then look for Google and it's going to be right there. It says Google. We're going to click on that and sure enough here is our Chrome folder. We can click on our Chrome folder, and then it says user data. You see where I'm getting that? If we click on this, it's going to definitely have all the user data, all the catch and all this other stuff that is that's going on with Chrome. All right. So for this to work, you're going to have to ask the user to close Chrome entirely. So I would have to close this window, and what, what, what I would normally do is I would click here and then I would make it I would rename it and I would just type it in call it old <clears throat> so 
keep in mind whenever they open up again it's going to create a new folder called Chrome as well it's going to create a new one once you open up Chrome again so the, and this is how it's going to be I'm going to right click Chrome and I'm going to run it as a different user so I'm going to type in BUCO let's see I can't see both and this is supposed to be a, a login and password ID it's not showing up properly There's some kind of weird corruption but what I'm typing in is actually a login ID and a password but you can't see it because there's some weird glitch there and I'm going to click OK BUCO and there it is now you can see it let me see if I can remember the password for that there it is so now I've opened up browser Chrome browser as the user and you can see that automatically created a new folder call, called Chrome okay one thing to keep in mind when you're doing this is that you can see that once you log in the user this is exactly what they're going to see as if they opened up Chrome for the first time so they're gonna to have to log in to Chrome again using their single sign-on login so if you can click here and you can click you know sign in that's fine but what I usually do I have them go to google.com and then I tell them to click on Gmail and th what this does usually is triggers the sign in for the single sign on system so you can tell them you can click or tell them click a sign on and then here you just type in your email address and then from there it's just going to work okay now they're going to be back into their email and they're going to and then notice that if they had any bookmarks here they're not you know they're not there so do this as well before you let them go so the way you would restore bookmarks if they have any if you go back to the Chrome old folder user data default and it's going to be called bookmarks so this is a backup of it but here's the bookmarks so you would take that copy go back to Google folder go back to new Chrome folder user data default and paste it in there now their bookmarks or cookie or bookmarks or favorites are back in okay and that would fix this issue that is present to us here that's how you resolve this specific issue it's a weird one because it's misleading but that's how you fix it and chances are that's how you fix any other web-based email issues and then of course uh, we're going to add internal note now this is all assuming that we are talking to the customer on on the phone or or in some other way like over instant messenger or something like that so uh, there's no reply to customer here because we're already talking to them um, in this uh, role-playing scenario but since we've resolved the issue I'm just going to type in resolve issue by Chrome reset going to save it and then I'm going to close the ticket I'm going to mark it as complete all right guys I hope you like this video uh, if you have any questions please let me know in the comments below again I have quite a few more of these ticketing system videos and very soon I'm going to combine all of them into one a really long one that you can sit through and, and just kind of follow along or just you know watch and, and learn from my actual work experience all right guys thank you so much again and take care have a good one bye bye hello my friends my name is Irvin also known as Bubble Man thank you so much for joining me today here's another example of help desk uh, ticket and a phone call that we're going to go through and if you like these type of videos please take one second to like this video i really appreciate it we're going to have another role-playing session and it's going to be very educational again thank you so much for supporting me by clicking the like button much obliged all right guys so here's our ticketing system if you haven't watched my videos on how to use ticketing systems i certainly have them check out my help desk playlist so in this case, uh, we're going to work on this ticket from uh, this gentleman here. And we're just going to select it because it's not assigned or anything like that. So the first thing we're going to do is assign it to ourselves. And I'm going to click over here real quick. 
and I'm going to assign it to myself. So what do we have here? Monitor is not working and then there is a number and it says call me. And this guy's name is Mike Moser. So in this case, this customer really wants us to call them. So in this case, we're not going to communicate via email or through the system or through an instant messenger or anything like that. This guy wants to be called. So we're going to call him and we're going to try to help him with a broken monitor. Now, I know that a lot of uh, uh, people are working from home nowadays. So in this case, we're going to role, role play um, into assuming that this guy or this customer is actually working from home so that way we can kind of provide uh, at least current time type of uh, situation but then again of course if when you do help desk you will help people that are working from home as well so let's give him a call and see how that goes hey this is mike Hello, sir. This is Irvin with Help Desk. I have your ticket about monitor not working. Now, just to make sure, is this Mike Moser? Yeah, this is Mike Moser. All right, sir. I just wanted to see uh, what I can do to help you with this. Um, so your monitor is not working? Yeah, that's right. My monitor is not working. I don't know what's going on this morning. I uh, logged in and... I couldn't, I don't know, it's just It's just a blank screen. It's just black, it like, kind of looks like it's dead. So I'm not sure what I can do here. Sir, um, do you, um, when was the, no, just to make sure, is your monitor turned on? Like, is there a green light on it or like some kind of indicator that's turned on? Yeah, it does, it does look like it's turned on, but I don't know what's going on. All right, no problem, sir. Now, does your uh, now just I just want to make sure is your computer turned on? Do you see any like indication on the computer itself that there's like a blinking lights or is there any activity on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's uh, it, it's working. I uh, pressed the on button and uh, it, it's it turned on. Everything seems to be working. It's just the monitors. I I can tell. I can tell that the I can hear the noise whenever I turned on the 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 computer. I heard the noise. You know that 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 noise that comes up every time you turn on a computer. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, that that's pretty good. Uh, that's a that's um that's a good thing actually. It's better than, you know, better for your monitor to be broken rather than the computer itself. Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, so um, do you by chance have two monitors? Yeah, I I actually do. Yeah, that's great, sir. So if you can, um, can you please unplug the one monitor that's not working? Yeah, I can try that. Hold on. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. So what's going on? Chances are that only one of the monitors is broken and not both of them. So if you unplug the one that's not working, the other one should come up with a picture. Uh, all right. All right. I'm, I'm going to try here. Hold on. All right. I, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it does. The second monitor does work. Yeah, I see I see the where I can log in and stuff. Well, that's great, sir. So uh, thankfully, it's just one monitor that's broken. Um, in this case, it, it really does sound like the first one or the one that your main one is. It wasn't working. It was just kind of dead. And I know you didn't uh, unplug anything before that or anything like that. No, no, no. I didn't touch anything. It's just, you know, that's how I just, uh, this morning is just not working. All right. So the reason I say it's good is because this way you can at least work with mo one monitor for, for now. But um, we can certainly replace your uh, broken one. So, I mean, there are a couple of ways of going about it. You can order a new one through the, the system that you have in place, maybe through the, through the company's website or something. I think there's an ordering website. Or if by chance you go to your local um, office uh, where they have the locally, maybe they can give you a new one or something like that. Because I know you work from home. So, um, all right, all right. Well, I'm glad I got one working. Uh, all right, I guess I'll just deal with this one or just work with, with the one for time being. Uh, all right, uh, well, thanks for your help. Yeah, no problem, sir. If there is anything else that you need help with, please let me know. Uh, but yeah, it does sound like just one of those monitors is, is broken. And, ch you know, chances are that if it's an older one, that just happens all the time. Um, all right, um, anything else? No, nah, no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for your help. All right, sure. No problem. You have a wonderful day. All right. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye. All right, so now that we have finished talking to the customer, the next thing we have to do is 
leave a uh, note or and even close the ticket in this case. So this is a good situation in which we can uh, do so. Uh, chances are, I mean, depending on the setup in your business environment, that you may want to route this ticket to their to his local support. It depends on whether he's going to actually go physically to the office where he works and get a monitor from there, you know, but we haven't, since we haven't gone through that with him and he doesn't know for sure, he can deal with that on his end. But of course, we're going to add a eternal note that simply says customers main monitor is not working. Um, let's see here. What, what else can we say? Can we provide more detail or, or uh, about what we did? Or are we just going to say that we resolved it by unplugging it? Well, it's up to you. I and mean, this is about a style of you, how you work. So, but I like to provide details. So what I'm going to do is type in instructed Mike to unplug the first slash broken monitor after doing so it appears that the monitor is indeed broken and then we're going to type in workaround down here and again this is your personal preference on how you put these notes in but you want to put down what you did and how you resolved it that's for sure your how you do it it's up to you this is what i'm going to do a workaround he will use his second monitor for time being later he will acquire a new monitor and that's pretty much what I'm going to leave here because what I did here is, you know, stated that indeed his monitor, main monitor is not working. Asked him to basically test it because uh, that's been, but the only thing you can do when you're not physically there. Asked him to unplug the first broken monitor. A lot of times you would just check the cables, see if everything is plugged in. But I kind of went with my guts here and just kind of asked him to unplug the first broken monitor. Because this situation also happens where people assume that their computer is broken, but it's actually not. What's going on is that their main monitor goes out, but their second monitor is actually just blank screen or it's just it's just black, right? So there's nothing going on. They assume their computer is broken. In this case, he kind of assumed it was a monitor and he was right. It's, it's the main monitor that's broken. And I instructed him to unplug the first broken one. And after that, it appears that the monitor is broken indeed. However, he has a workaround, which is his second monitor for time being. So we're going to save that. And uh, we're going to change the status to complete. And... Uh, I think that saved it. I always forget where there's actually a save button because I use a bunch of different ticketing systems. And definitely at my main job, I use a different ticketing system and there's actual save button that I have to click after I complete it. Well, there you guys, there you have it, guys. Uh, this is how you resolve this simple monitor ticket, but it's a good kind of um, shows you how to deal with a customer in, in a sense. And I hope you like my role playing. Obviously, you can tell that it was me doing the voice. I... Uh, I, I kind of went with um, Dr. Fauci's raspy voice. If you recognize that uh, or if you see that in that, <laughs> let me know. But that's kind of what I went with. It was the, uh, I think his name is Anthony Fauci, right? You guys know what I'm talking about um, if you're up to date on the current situation in the world. But yeah, uh, I, I, that's, that's what I try to go for, for his voice. Anyways, if you have a second, please leave a like. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. I will uh, I will definitely answer them for you. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a pleasant day. I hope you have a nice, pleasant Thursday. Was it Thursday? Yes, today is Thursday. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, we have another crash course of what I typically do every couple of months, and that is 
combine some of my most recent videos into one so it's a single place to start watching everything that I made because I feel like it's important and maybe it's easier to find for people watching. So here we are. We have starting off a couple of videos on VPN. First VPN video talks about troubleshooting VPN. Some of the most common things to kind of look for and kind of explain to you what VPN is for those people who are new to IT. Video explains things to think about when it comes to working on VPN and especially when a user asks for a password reset. Following on that, we have Zoom troubleshooting setup and audio issues that you may come across when it comes to Zoom. Following that is a video on how to deal with a broken monitor. And then after that, we have a video on broken links, website links. And the last video is basically about installing Windows 10. I hope you like it. Please take a moment to like this video and share it with your friends. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them as usual. All right, let's get into it. As somebody who might be working help desk or just tech support for a company, you'll have people who work remotely. And nowadays we have a lot of people working from home. So in order for them to actually be able to work, now they have to connect to the company's network. But now they can't work because they're not on the company's network. They're not physically there at the office. So they have to use VPN software to connect directly and attach themselves to the network of the company. This is why they use VPN software to do so. Now, what I have up right now is just a home user VPN that anybody can use. Not to be confused with a business VPN. This is the reason I have it up. This is going to be totally different. This home one that you can go to google.com and download free VPN, all it does is just hide your location so that way it looks like you're connected to the internet from some other country. That's all it does. It's completely different from business VPN in the sense of access to, to the resources that you need to work as somebody who works for a company. All right, so this is a sample of regular free VPN that regular people use, not workers. So let me show you. Here's the list of servers that they pick. So if they, for example, run this and they, for example, click Brazil, suddenly now they're gonna look like they're connected to the internet from Brazil. So they're basically trying to hide their location. This is not the same thing as a business VPN. All right, that being said, Let's look at a business VPN, how it kind of looks like. When it comes to business VPN, you typically get something similar to this. You launch the application and you get a similar pop-up to this. And it asks you for your username, your password, and a second password. So what is this second password? We know this is pretty straightforward. The username is probably going to be your network login or your domain login ID. It's going to be the same thing as what they use when they're at the office. So it's gonna be the exact same thing most of the time. It's gonna be the exact same thing as what they use at the office. Their username is going to be exact same thing. I'm sorry for repeating that. I just wanna make sure that you know this. And the password is going to be the same thing as they use for the office when they log into their computer. Second password, however, is different. This is usually an RSA token. So what is RSA token? RSA token is a one-time password that is always randomized. I think it usually lasts 60 seconds once you get that one-time password, and then it allows you to log in. You may have seen this with some websites. Some websites use one-time passwords to access your different types of accounts. It's very similar to that. So let's concentrate on this second password part of it first. This is kind of what it looks like. This is an old school way of getting that, that one-time password. It's an uh, token that is gen randomly generated. So basically what happens is you press a button, for example, like here or there, and it generates a random number that you use as the second password. A lot of times these are either hardware tokens. This is what they are. These are hardware tokens, but there are also software tokens. Let me just kind of scroll down to show you that. You can get a software token that kind of looks like this. 
here it is this one here where it says vpn token this is something that's installed on their computer as well so they'll have an icon on their computer with the vpn software so the vpn software is going to be separate and now, but they have to launch this vpn token to get this random code to use as part of their login login as the second password it might be the way they put in the password the second password for the vpn token might be slightly different varying from vpn software to another but in the nutshell they're going to need that vpn token or rsa token if you will in order to get that second password so they can log in and access the vpn or the network that they're trying to connect to you can also have a mobile version of that so you can have a mobile phone i don't know if i have an example of that here but you can install an app on your some companies have an option of installing app on your phone that generates this random token so that's the first thing to be concerned about when it comes to connecting through vpn when it comes to customer connecting to the VPN. so this is the main thing that you see when it comes to vpn uh, with help desk when people call in or contact the help desk there most of the time they're going to say i can't connect to the vpn the main thing to learn when you work for some company is to learn how they are connecting that's the main thing now let's move on to other things let's look at a vpn servers and how they are different from uh, how they are different from let me see here from regular vpns this is kind of what it's going to look like for somebody for example working in the united states when they will launch their VPN software, they may get a list of servers that kind of look like this. And they're all going to be in US. And all of these are most likely the servers for the exact same company. So this is all the same network. They're all on the same network. They're just different location. This is very normal when they will launch their VPN software. They will see a bunch of different servers and they may choose to select one of these. The reason it, you want to know about this is because sometimes some of these servers will be down. It happens. Sometimes there will be way too many people trying to connect, for example, to the same one. Let's look at the let's look at the capacities here, for example. You can see that the Los Angeles one is the very first one. So people automatically tend to click on the very first server available. And you can see that in this example, there's 13% capacity already meaning that it has the most well this one has a lot too 15 percent but people a lot of times tend to pick the very first uh, vpn server for their company either way if they're having trouble suddenly connecting to for example los angeles here just ask them to connect to miami new york san jose or seattle so that's one other thing to kind of keep in mind when it comes to connection issues now the other thing uh, that is very common when it comes to VPN connection is that software is simply not there. So you have to have a, a way to uh, reinstall software, to reinstall VPN software for the user. And a lot of times what happens is a company will set up a website that user can log into before they are connected to VPN so for example what happens is they would get a link they would type in that link whatever that may be get my vpn software.com for example this is not i don't even know if this is a real website or not but this is kind of what would happen they would get a link and keep in mind they're they're still there at this time they're not connected their problem is they cannot connect to vpn and they don't have software either so they, what happens usually is they will have a link that they go to. And once they go to that link, they can download the software and install it. So you may have to help them install that software as well if they need admin privileges, this and that. That's just a basic troubleshooting when it comes to installing software. But keep that in mind. If they don't have it, there has to be a way to get that VPN software installed onto their computer before they're connected to the VPN. You, you see what I'm saying? There has to be an external access or a way to initiate the VPN software installation. So that way they can afterwards connect to the VPN and have all the resources available to them afterwards 
um, so they can just get back to work and start working. All right, guys, I believe this covers the VPN uh, troubleshooting when it comes to help desk or general tech support. Let me know if you've encountered anything else that might be related to VPN. I think I covered kind of the most common issues when it comes to VPN. Let me know in the comments if there is anything that I've missed. I'd be interesting to hear different scenarios, different options. But keep in mind, there are many, many different ways of initiating VPN. Companies a lot of times have their own proprietary software, you know, different prerequisites, meaning they may have a different uh, security so may not even require a second password or RSA token, which is kind of silly, but you do see that with smaller companies uh, that may necessarily have the manpower to set all this up and you know maintain, do the maintenance on it and keep up with all of that stuff. So it's going to be it's going to vary a little bit, but in general, what I've explained to you is exactly the main things. There, there are exactly the, the main things to be concerned about and to learn when it comes to troubleshooting VPN connections. So with this knowledge, you can literally go, for example, to an interview for help desk. And when they ask you about the VPN, you can explain to them how VPN works in this type of sense. Again, it's totally different from VPN that you download from the internet to hide your location. It's completely different. It, it works the same way when it comes to connections, but it's not the same function because here you are just hiding your identity from the rest of the internet while VPN for a business allows you connect, allows you to connect to the company's network. So that way you have access to all of those resources. So that way you can work so you can get back to work. So this issue happens a lot when person's password expires their password expires and suddenly they cannot get onto VPN. They can typically log into their computer, but they can't get on their VPN because they don't get that prompt to change their password at all. And they can't just do control alt delete. This is where you can usually click change password or it would just it would just force you to change the password. They can't do that because they're not on VPN yet. They are disconnected at this time. So the only thing they can do as they typically do is just call help desk and ask for a password reset. But we got to make sure that we don't just jump into resetting until we do a couple of things first. Let's have a look how I handle this call. And if you like my role playing, uh, if you do, please take a second to like this video. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. So user decides that they need to change their password. So they need help with that. So what they do is they pick up the phone and call the help desk. And it goes something like this. Hi, my name is Bob. Can you uh, reset my password? I'm having a lot of trouble logging in. Can you reset my password? Sure thing, sir. I can reset your password. So this is something you would normally say to anybody who calls in and asks for a password change or a reset. So what can you do with that? The thing is, though, you have to keep in mind that when he's on VPN, he will not be able to take that temporary password that you've given to him and change it to his permanent password. Well, why is that? He's not connected to the same domain that you're changing his password on. So the question we need to ask him first is, are you able, sir, are you able to get on VPN? No, I, uh, I can't. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm not on VPN. I can't log into VPN. That's why I need you to reset my password. Sure thing, sir. But keep in mind that unless you're on a VPN, uh, me changing your password is not going to help you. Now, just to make sure, are you already logged in to the computer? Oh, uh, no, not not at the time. It's not at the moment. Uh, you want me to log in? Yes, please, sir. Uh, please log into the computer and make sure you stay logged in. Uh, I can't give you a temporary password uh, because the system is set up in such way where you can't change it to your permanent password until you're connected with your VPN first. And in order for you to connect to the VPN first, I got to give you a permanent password 
because it just won't work. You can't use your temporary password to log into the VPN. And once you are logged into VPN, uh, you can go ahead and update all your other systems by simply locking your computer and then unlocking your computer with your new permanent password. Unfortunately, yet again, I can't give you a temporary password because of the current uh, setup and the system setup situation that we have. And um, that's the only way I can help you with that. I hope that works out for you. Well, that will that'll work out for me. I just, uh, you know, thanks for telling me that. I'm going to make sure that I use this per permanent password. And then I just want to make sure I can get on right now. Thanks for your help. Sure thing, sir. I, I just wanted to make sure that you can get on VPN as a, as a number one thing. Uh, so that way, you know, you can get back to work or do whatever you need to do. Uh, but uh, yeah, is there anything else I need to, you need help with? No, I'm okay. Thanks for your help. I appreciate it. Yeah, you have a nice day. All right. Thank you, sir. And you as well. Have a good one. Bye-bye. And there you have it, my friends. The only thing left to do here is show you footage from one of my videos on how to reset a password in Active Directory. Let me know if you like my puppeteering. I know you can probably see my mouse pointer moving the hands up and down. I hope this is something that people uh, might uh, find enjoyable. I uh, just kind of kind of a overview of what we've gone over. The number one thing to keep mind in mind here is that if somebody is trying to connect to VPN, they need to have a working permanent password. If their password has expired, they obviously can't change it uh, when they are not connected to the VPN. Because remember, when you call help desk, you give them a temporary password, at which point they get a notification or forced to change it to a permanent password. That doesn't happen when you're trying to connect to the VPN. And if you're not on VPN, you're not going to be able to get that notification or that prompt at all. So you got to give them a permanent password. And if they decide to change it afterwards to something else, they can. So this is something you can mention as well. All right. Thank you so much for watching. And again, here is my video on how to change passwords and Active Directory. All right, let's go ahead and open up Active Directory. And within Active Directory on the left hand side, you can see a folder that's called users. If you select that, if you select users, you can see that a bunch of different users and groups show up in there. So you can scroll down and look for that login or the person's name. However, the easiest way to look somebody up is if you right click the users folder and select find. In here, you can type in the name of the user and he said Irvin underscore C-A-N. So it's going to click find now. And here it is. We found the user. We can simply select it, double click it, and it should pull up user's account. So let's see what's going on with that. He said he can't log in. So the next thing we're going to look up is the password. So we're going to click on the account. If we suspect that user is locked in the account tab here, we can simply click on the check mark like this where it says unlock account, select apply or OK, and this will unlock the user's account. Now we can get back to them and let them know to try again. Well, there you go, my friends. This is how you fully handle a help desk call in which you would unlock user accounts. Of course, there are other things you can look at. If you go to the account, you can make some changes to it when it related to password. If you want to change their password, you can change it here. If you select user must change password at the next logon, is something what I would um, uh, highly recommend in a business environment. So this is a part of security. You want the user to have their own password. So I highly suggest that you check user must change their password at the next login because after you change it, you give them a temporary password, they should be able to set their own. In order to change the password, we have to go back to the users folder and then find the user and then right click it and then select reset password. However, this is kind of counterpoint to what I said earlier that you know, if this is populated with thousands and thousands of users, it may not be easy to find. However, 
if you do right click on the users folder select find and do the thing I told you earlier is to type in Irvin CAN so we can find this user here since we found it already we don't have to dig through the actor directory a lot of people actually don't show this on their videos when they show how to reset the password is that now since you already found it you don't have to dig and kind of like you know your eyes are starting to dry out because you're trying to find this user you can just find it here and then right click and reset password and we're going to change the password to something temporarily and then again make sure this is checked user must change the password at the next login and then if their account is locked as well you can check that as well and then just click OK and now it says the password for Irvin has been changed but before we do that please take one second to click the like button and as always if you have any questions leave them in the comments I will answer them all right guys thank you so much I appreciate that so here's what zoom looks like when you install it this is the zoom application installed on your computer when somebody gives you just a link and you've never used zoom before and chances are if they just sent you a link you will simply click on the link and the link will say hey do you want to install zoom and then you click open zoom or install zoom and it's going to install it and then what you get and what you actually see is this window this is the window that you would typically see first time you use zoom and then you realize maybe my audio is not working people can't hear me or people can't see me we're going to definitely talk about that but the also a first pop-up that might you might see is it's going to ask you whether you want to use your computer uh, as audio so you have to make sure that you click use my computer as audio so that's going to pop up and you just click on that and that's very simple but then even then if you don't have your audio set up correctly it may not work let's look at the microphone uh, icon here you can see there's activity there that means it's detecting that there is a microphone it's picking up all those sounds from the microphones coming through that's good however we may have multiple microphones how do we know which one is being used correctly or if any so what if that's not happening that means we need to tell it which microphone needs to be used so if we click on this little arrow here we're going to see a lot of stuff and you can see I have a lot of stuff the reason I do is because you know I'm a youtuber I have a lots of equipment so there's going to be a lot of stuff that shows up if you simply have a head if you simply have a headset all you got to do is find out what is the name of it in my case I have a headset and it's called Plantronics C610 so I'm going to make sure I select that as the speaker because otherwise I won't be able to hear people so now my Plantronics C610 C610 is selected so that's my speaker that's what I'm going to hear inside of my Plantronics headset that I'm going to put on my head and then same thing for microphone I'm going to make sure that this microphone is selected and notice it's still working the reason it's working is because it's selected as same as system and I have multiple ones so it's probably picking up my microphone that I'm speaking to right now which is not set this is if you if you're using like a laptop if you have a laptop you have to make sure that the microphones laptop and speakers are selected so if you're not using a website and just your built-in laptop camera and the microphone make sure that Realtek is selected for the speakers like this speakers and the camera since I'm not using a laptop all you see is speakers and no cam no microphone here but if I was to for example switch to my a uh, webcam and like for example I have a uh, microphone on a webcam that is called HD Pro webcam and I'm going to select that if you want if I want to use that camera now this webcam doesn't have speakers so I'm going to make sure that Realtek is just enabled which is my PC speakers right so again don't pay attention to this last part too much unless you have these specific things but if you're using a headset make sure you select the correct headset in both of the, these menus that way it makes it simple for you but if you have a laptop just a laptop you won't have this many things in here so just make sure that the real tech is selected but if you have a webcam make sure that the webcam is selected and uh, the PC's speakers so now you can see how I've selected the microphone for the Plantronics and it's actually picking up a little bit less of it because it's kind of 
uh, about a foot or so away from me. So it's picking up less of it. Right now I'm speaking into something else. Anyways, that's the audio. Uh, we can certainly test it. You can test it here, test speaker and microphone, and it goes through this setup where it detects the levels of it. And then it tells you, do you hear the ringtone? And it's a really good way to actually make sure that your headset or your audio is working. So I highly suggest you use that for testing. And then you can also have, if you have a phone embedded, that's another thing. Uh, but you know, this is, uh, this is video specifically for somebody who chances are just installed a Zoom for the first time. And this phone integration is something else. So I don't necessarily want to talk about this because it'd be way too much and way too confusing. Um, and then uh, you can, if you click leave computer audio, uh, that means you can just like copying and use your like phone, like your cell phone, you know, or your, your home phone if you have them. And then if you want to really look at the audio settings, you can click on the audio settings here. And then you can see again what is selected in just a different separate menu. But it's the same thing we did earlier, except you can adjust the output levels and this and that, you know. And then there are other things you can do, like use separate audio device to play a ringtone simultaneously. For example, if you have a headset, but you want your ringtone to come through the computer speakers, make sure that this is checked like that, and then select speakers, real tech. So now this time it, the ringtone is going to come through the PC speakers. There are a lot of issues, uh, a lot of issues, a lot of things you can do here. And then, you know, just play with them and make sure, you know, kind of find out what your preferences are. And then, you know, like, for example, you can automatically mute your microphone when you join a meeting. These are all personal preferences. You can go to advanced and deal in and, you know, adjust the background noise. But this is fine as it is. I wouldn't worry about it. Just kind of leave it at that. Otherwise, you can just cause issues, more issues with the audio. And if it works, you know, don't try to fix what's not broken type of thing, you know. So just make sure that your proper microphone and speaker are selected. Do a quick test on them and make sure that works. Now let's look at the video. Video, all right now I just have a picture there and if I click start video, you can see me here talking and this is, uh, <laughs> this is my puppet here, I guess, and I just have that for, and you can see me over here in the, in the right hand corner, uh, right there, you can see me uh, just kind of talking and waving. So I'm the puppeteer, if you will. So my video is enabled here, but if I want to stop at any time, I can just click stop. And then if I want to select a different camera, I can certainly do that. And for example, select this HD you know, webcam or whatever your webcam is, it's going to be listed there. Now keep in mind that if you have a camera open in another program, that it may not work at all. Like in this example, if I select my pro webcam here, it's not going to work because I have it open another program. So if I click start, it just doesn't do anything. It's, it literally says cannot start video, fail to start video camera, please select another video and camera settings. I know you can't see that error pop up because it's on my second screen where my puppet is. And I'm going to actually switch to it. So maybe, maybe hopefully it stays there. Yeah, you can see it right there that there is the error cannot start video because I had um, camera, um, I clicked on a camera that's been used by something else. So make sure that no other program is open and using your camera. That's why you get that error, you know? Otherwise it's, you know, it's pretty straightforward. You select the camera you want to use and that's that. Now, and then you can look, I mean, let's look at the video settings here, what we have here. And uh, you can set different uh, options. Of course, select the camera you want to use again, but you can also see that you can change the aspect ratios, enable HD, and you can mirror your video. You can touch up your appearance to make yourself look prettier. And, uh, you know, different personal preferences that you want to show people about you. Camera is one of those things that is, you know, I don't like using it um, for obvious reasons because I'm ugly, but, you know, you know, some people like it, some people like it. So, and that's fine. Um, I personally don't care for it. Here's a, some kind of fun thing that you can look at and that is virtual uh, backgrounds. So let me see if this works since I have a green screen going on. I wonder if it'll actually detect it decently or do anything with it. And I'm going to select that. I have a green screen. Oh, wow. Hey, that's pretty cool actually. Look at that. Would y'all look at that? All right, all right, let me, let me close it here. I'm going to start video. Hey, that's not bad. 
So if you have a green screen, this works really cool, doesn't it? I like that. That's pretty cool. It looks like I'm in space and whatnot. Let's change to something else. Choose a virtual background. Ooh, at the beach. I wish I was at the beach right now. Look at that. Would you look at that? That's pretty cool. Oh, look, it's moving. <laughs> That's actually pretty fun. I've seen other people's um, you get other people using virtual backgrounds and it kind of looks off because they don't have green screen but in my case I have a perfect green screen because it's softer there's no cloth behind me or anything like that it's just my puppet and he um, has a perfect green screen because it's 100% green ski and let's do one other oh okay well, I think this one's the best although it's not moving and then there's none you can see there's my perfect green screen over here you know all right guys i hope you like this video i think it's really fun to actually create this video i uh, uh it's it's cool it's cool like it's not that hard to use but yeah, you know, people still have issues and that's understandable it's okay to have these type of issues you know it's okay as long as we know how to fix them these are normal computer issues that happen all the time all right guys so here's our ticketing system. If you haven't watched my videos on how to use ticketing systems, I certainly have them. Check out my help desk playlist. So in this case, uh, we're going to work on this ticket from uh, this gentleman here. And we're just going to select it because it's not assigned or anything like that. So the first thing we're going to do is assign it to ourselves. And I'm going to click over here real quick and I'm going to assign it to myself. So what do we have here? This ticket is about my monitor is not working and then there is a number and it says call me. And this guy's name is Mike Moser. So in this case, this customer really wants us to call them. So in this case, we're not going to communicate via email or through the system or through an instant messenger or anything like that. This guy wants to be called. So we're we going to call him and we're going to try to help him with a broken monitor now i know that a lot of uh, uh people are working from home nowadays so in this case we're going to role, role play um, into assuming that this guy or this customer is actually working from home so that way we can kind of provide uh, at least current time type of uh, situation but then again of course when you do help desk you will help people that are working from home as well. So let's give him a call and see how that goes. Hey, this is Mike. Hello, sir. This is Irvin with Help Desk. I have your ticket about monitor not working. Now, just to make sure, is this Mike Moser? Yeah, this is Mike Moser. All right, sir. I just wanted to see uh, what I can do to help you with this. Um, so your monitor is not working. Yeah, that's right. My monitor is not working. I don't know what's going on this morning. I uh, logged in and I couldn't, I don't know. It's just, it's just a blank screen. It's just black. It like, kind of looks like it's dead. So I'm not sure what I can do here. Sir, um, do you, um, when was the, no, just to make sure. Is your monitor turned on? Like, is there a green light on it or like some kind of indicator that's turned on? Yeah, it does. It does look like it's turned on, but I don't know what's going on. All right. No problem, sir. Now, does your, uh, now just, I just want to make sure, is your computer turned on? Do you see any like indication on the computer itself that there's like a blinking lights or is there any activity on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's uh, it, it's working. I uh, pressed the on button and uh, it, it's it turned on. Everything seems to be working. It's just the monitors. I I can tell. I can tell that the I can hear the noise whenever I turned on the the, the computer. I heard the noise. You know that 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 noise that comes up every time you turn on a computer. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that that's pretty good. Uh, that's a that's um that's a good thing actually. It's better than, you know, better for your monitor to be broken rather than the computer itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. So um, do you by chance have two monitors? Yeah, I I actually do. Yeah. That's great, sir. So if you can, um, can you please unplug the one monitor that's not working? Yeah, I can try that. Hold on. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. So what's going on? Chances are that only one of the monitors is 
broken and not both of them. So if you unplug the one that's not working, the other one should come up with a picture. Uh, all right, all right, I'm, I'm going to try here. Hold on. All right. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, yeah, it does. The second monitor does work. Yeah, I see I see the where I can log in and stuff. Well, that's great, sir. So uh, thankfully, it's just one monitor that's broken. Um, in this case, it, it really does sound like the first one or the one that your main one is it wasn't working it was just kind of dead and i know you didn't uh, unplug anything before that or anything like that no 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 i didn't touch anything it's just you know that's how i just I this morning is just stop working all right so the reason i say it's good is because this way you can at least work with one monitor for for now but um, we can certainly replace your uh, broken one so i mean there are a couple of ways of going about it you can order a new one through the the system that you have in place maybe through the through the company's website or something i think there's an ordering website or if by chance you go to your local um, office uh, where they have the uh, you know it guys locally maybe they can give you a new one or something like that because i know you work home so um all right all right well i'm glad i got one working uh all right, I guess I'll just deal with this one or just work with, with the one for time being. Uh, all right, uh, well, thanks for your help. Yeah, no problem, sir. If there is anything else that you need help with, please let me know. Uh, but yeah, it does sound like just one of those monitors is, is broken. And, ch you know, chances are that if it's an older one, that just happens all the time. Um, all right, um, anything else? No, nah, no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for your help. All right, sure. No problem. You have a wonderful day. All right. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye. All right, so now that we have finished talking to the customer, the next thing we have to do is uh, leave a uh, note or and even close there, you know. But we haven't, since we haven't gone through that with him and he doesn't know for sure, he can deal with that on his end. But of course, we're going to add a eternal note that simply says, customers, monitor is not working um, let's see here what what else can we say can we provide more detail or or uh, about what we did or are we just gonna say that we resolved it by unplugging it well it's up to you I and mean, this is about a style of you how you work so but I like to provide details so what I'm going to do is type in instructed my to on plug the first slash broken monitor after doing so it appears that the monitor is indeed broken and then we're going to type in workaround down here and again this is your personal preference on how you put these notes in but you want to put down what you did and how you resolved it that's for sure your how you do it it's up to you this is what i'm going to do a workaround he will use his second monitor for time being later he will acquire a new monitor and that's pretty much what i'm going to leave here because what i did here is you know stated that indeed his monitor main monitor is not working asked him to basically test it because uh, that's been about the only thing you can do when you're not physically there asked him to unplug the first broken monitor a lot of times you would just check the cables, see if everything is plugged in. But I kind of went with my guts here and just kind of asked him to unplug the first broken monitor. Because this situation also happens where people assume that their computer is broken, but it's actually not. What's going on is that their main monitor goes out, but their second monitor is actually just blank screen or it's just, it's just black, right? So there's nothing going on. They assume their computer is broken. In this case, he kind of assumed it was a monitor and he was wrecked. It's, it's the main monitor that's broken, and I instructed him to unplug the first broken one, and after that, it appears that the monitor is broken indeed. However, he has a workaround, which is his second monitor for time being. So we're going to save that, and uh, we're going to change the status to complete, and 
I think that saved it. I, I always forget where there's actually a save button because I use a bunch of different ticketing systems. And definitely at my main job, I use a different ticketing system and there's an actual save button that I have to click after I completed. Well, there you guys, there you have it, guys. Uh, this is how you resolve this simple monitor ticket, but it's a good kind of... Um, shows you how to deal with a customer in, in a sense. And I hope you like my role playing. Obviously you can tell that it was me doing the voice. I uh, I, I kind of went with um, Dr. Fauci's raspy voice. If you recognize that, uh, or if you see that in that, <laughs> let me know. But that's kind of what I went with. It was the, uh, I think his name is Anthony Fauci, right? You guys know what I'm talking about um, if you're up to date on the current situation in the world. All right, guys. So. Let's look at this ticket. I have a, this a mock-up ticket that I created in this uh, service desk system, and it's called My Email Is Not Work. The uh, description would say, Hi, my email is not working. This is my link. And then they show you a link, and there's a link right there. We can click on it. We can check it out. That's perfectly fine. And then we have an attachment of an error. And if we click on that, it clues to what the problem is. So I love seeing attachments of the errors because they can save me a lot of time when, when it comes to working tickets. And we already, you know, we can already guess what the problem here is because we've seen this type of website before many, many times. Chances are we all use this type of website and we can see immediately why mail is not working. Their email is not working. And if we click on the link, sure enough, it's not working because it's broken. But as, as we can see here, we, we know that we are just missing the L there. So if we just type in L there, just a sec, type in L, we can see that the email is working. So we can simply come back to the customer or user and just say, hey, this is the correct link, which is perfect and great. This is easy ticket to do and it's no problem, right? The situation what I wanted to talk about is related to when a user or a customer reports a link not working of a website that you're not familiar with at all. So we can fix this one easily just by adding L. But when we go to a website, for example, imagine if this was the problem here, this link up here. Imagine if that was the problem. How would we even know that this part of it is not missing, just that eight? How do we know that? So we won't. We won't know that. It's not like we know every hyperlink for each website to know for sure whether the user is using that specific link. I mean, it can extend to, as far as we know, a limited length. So how do we deal with that specific issue? So let's pretend that this is a website that's not google.com. That's something totally different. Now we have to reach out to the customer and preferably this issue I would handle preferably over the IM or instant messenger if available within that company. If not, you may have to call the user and talk to them directly. That might be another option. And the way I would go approach this, I would reply to the customer. I would say, hello, my name is Irvin with help desk. I have your ticket about broken a link. And then if, if it's, again, if it's a website that we're not familiar with, we don't know for sure. Because the thing is, though, we click on the link and we also get the same error. So we don't know whether they're using the correct link or not, or if the website is down for sure. So we have to figure out first whether it's the broken link, because 90% of the time, it's the wrong link that they're using. And it's not necessarily their fault or anything like that. We have to make sure that we're respectful towards the user or the customer because this type of stuff happens, you know, especially if they're pushing back saying that it's not, you know, it's, you know, there, there's, there is the correct link, but that's okay. We're going to get to that part here. So, hello, my name is Irvin with help desk. I have your ticket about broken link. And then we can say, um, if we're suspecting a wrong link that they're using is anybody else in your group having this issue or we can say is anybody else in your group able to access this website All right so we can send that off 
to them and wait for their reply. But you know, since since it's a website, we don't know. We we kind of want to resolve this as quickly as possible. We don't want to necessarily wait for them to receive an email from the ticketing system for the notification. Wait for them to reply this and that. That I mean, that's fine if you know or if they happen to be watching their email all the time. But chances are they're not. This is what I'm saying. You might want to reach them over the IM if possible or if you want to call them. So a lot of times they come back and say this, customer, yes, that is the correct link, right? So they may come back and just say that. Then, then what do you do? And if you're still suspecting uh, that it is the you know that it that it is the wrong link. You can say, "Can you please check with one other person just to be sure?" And then they might come back and say, uh, "Usually after a little bit because they are you know chances are they are probably checking you know," and then. Uh, you know, if they come back and say, yes, it's working for them. So this is your clue right here immediately. We immediately have like even higher suspicion that it is indeed a wrong link, a wrong link that they might be using. If, is, if this is working for somebody else, and not for them, and it's obviously not working for us. That's because I, Irvin, and the customer, and the customer, we both have the wrong link that was provided by the customer. And then if they keep saying, if they keep insisting, they are using the same link as me. You can say, can you please show me the screenshot of a working website? So you gotta be, you gotta be very careful with this. You gotta be kind of uh, systematic in a way, but also respectful at the same time. You can't just tell them, no, you are using the wrong link. That's not that's not the way you deal with. Uh, customers or users on the help desk. So customer would, you know, reply with screenshot. And then you would look at that screenshot and then chances are that that screenshot will have that clue to you of what the correct link. So you're looking at it and then you're like, well, you are unfortunately you are using the wrong link because you're missing like an eight or in our case of the email here, you know, we can go back to this. If we look at it, we can say, well, in this case, you're missing an L, so that indeed is the wrong link, unfortunately. And that would resolve that. Sure, at some point, you will come across an issue where it's a website that it, it you know, the website is down for everybody. So and and that's different, you know. If you you know, especially if you're familiar with the website, you'll know. Yeah, this is not normal, this and that. But in this case, this is how you deal with a customer or a user that simply has a wrong link for whatever reason. It happens. You just got to be respectful and be systematic about it and very professional about it. This comes up a lot on help desk wrong link tickets. It's very very common thing. All right, guys. I hope you, I hope you like this video. I tried to make it as as a real world example as possible and explain it in a way where it's easy to understand. Please let me know what you think in the comments below. If you have any questions, I have lots of help desk videos that are very, uh, very useful, very popular. A lot of people like them, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Okay. All right. I'll see you next time. Bye bye. Oh, wait, wait, I almost forgot to mention, guys, I have a lots of written stuff that's related to help desk, network administration, system administration, all kinds of IT topics. I don't even remember how many I got, but it's on my website. It's at CosmicNovo.com. So if you go there, you can see that I have a bunch of different 
written versions of all kinds of different IT stuff that you can read if you're if you would if you would rather read um, some of this stuff then you can certainly do so on my website so in my recent video I was installing Windows 10 on the laptop that I've upgraded with an M.2 drive and my excitement and happiness went that to being very angry at trying to install Windows 10 on it I do realize that this version of Windows 10 is 1909 I feel like things changed or maybe I missed something please let me know this video that you're about to watch is completely unedited aside from the part of me just adding this intro but everything else is just straight through without cuts and my experience was not not very good installing Windows 10 it the, the stuff and the amount of things they were making me do just to get into the Windows 10 was very infuriating at some point and uh, I hope that doesn't translate to you guys but I just wanted to share it you know this is unedited uh, fairly long clip so here you're going to watch me basically install Windows 10 on this laptop alright here it comes uh, now we're going to see how quickly we can install Windows on it keep in mind that the USB stick that I put on there is uh, that I plugged in it's a very old one that is super slow too so but you know I digress we'll see how fast we can install operating system on it uh, if it takes too long I'll certainly uh, edit that out but hey uh, who knows uh, maybe it's gonna be pretty quick alright you know to select new install by the way if you're just there's our drive going to create a new partition I'm just going to leave it a default because I want to use all of it and what was I going to say so it creates a bunch of different partitions one just has to be like that for um, just the way operating system works do you want to proceed yes and uh, yeah very important otherwise you won't be able to boot and I get that question a lot from uh, it's definitely possible but not just the regular UEFI either. Sometimes you gotta have the most recent one, most recent version. I'm gonna get what was it the most current one? 1.3 or 1.4? I'm not sure. But um, this one is uh, definitely going fast, considering it's it's loading from a USB 2.0 and a really old thumb drive. That matter of fact, I think I washed one time in my pants because it's one of those that you put on your keychain, you know. Um, it, it it fell off the keychain and it stayed in my pants in my pocket but uh, I still use it it's an old 32 gigabyte drive slow but hey that's going pretty fast so I'm happy with that I um, what we're gonna do here I'm going to do a fresh install I'm going to install crystal disk and we're gonna run that right away matter of fact I'm not even going to install any drivers for this Samsung NVMe I'm gonna test it without any Samsung drivers installed. Whatever Windows gives me, I'm gonna test it with that. What happens, happens, right? And I'm gonna make sure I disable uh, any, I'm gonna put basically a laptop this into airplane mode so there's no Wi-Fi um, enabled. I'm only going to enable it just so I can install Crystal Disk. But I don't want any updates to start doing because that's the first thing that happens once you install a fresh Windows copy. Oh yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Windows 10 if you already had Windows 10 on the computer, you can just reinstall it. And if you get that pop-up, do you want to register and whatnot? Uh, don't worry about that. As soon as you get on the internet, it's going to be, it's going to register it. You know, so because it knows it's hardware-based, so it's okay for you to install a new hard drive. I mean, they know that you're going to install a new hard drive because it knows. Um, it's it's basically going to know that it's the same computer and it's the same key, same key and same license. So you don't have to worry about oh am I gonna be able to reinstall Windows on it yes you can I will definitely get a pop-up do you want to register it or you know this and that but as soon as I get to the, on the internet get on the internet it's going to work um, same thing if you're doing a fresh install on a brand new computer if you have a Windows 7 key you can also use that to um, you know to activate your Windows that's what I meant to say register activate not register you know it's it's different it's activate registering windows is basically creating a windows microsoft account to register your product but how long have i been speaking this is almost done it's 95 percent and um 
that's getting ready files for installation. We'll see how long it takes to install uh, everything else. But so far it's going really fast, considering it has to read from a something super slow. But that's okay, you know. I, I think it's going to be really fast anyways. Wow, it instantly installed features. Uh, there's there can't you can't get any updates because it's not connected to the internet. And wow, that's it's going pretty fast. Let me do a little zoom out action here, so you guys can see the little progress bar down there. Oh wow, it's already done. Oh my god. Oh wow. Okay, okay. See, it's gonna restart up there. Oops, sorry about that. I didn't mean to shake the screen. I just accidentally hit the the tripod. So it's rebooting right now, and should I unplug it? No, I was thinking about my USB stick. Hopefully it doesn't, because it's going. Hopefully it doesn't try to boot from that again. I, uh, well, I'm just gonna let it be. If I have to remove the thumb drive in a second here, I'll certainly do that. All right, come on, baby, come on, come on, baby. Let's make it happen. Let's make it for the people. Let's make it happen for the people watching. By the way, guys, since we're waiting on this, come on, man, click the like button. Click the like button. I know you got one second. Okay, so it's trying to install it again. So I'm just gonna pull the hard, the uh, thumb thumb drive out, real quick, and I'm going to cancel this. It's what I should have done right away. So once I once it, this happens, it's it's going to, it, it's done. That that was, what was it? I'm gonna have to check. Maybe three minutes or something like that. Maybe three minutes to install from a slow thumb drive. Man, I'm very optimistic to see how fast this is gonna go. Wow, did you see that? That went quickly. All right. Now, usually also whenever you create a new, like a login account for somebody, that can take a while too. Basically your login ID whenever you you know, trying to do something on the computer and you gotta have a login ID. We'll see how fast that goes. I suspect here very shortly it's gonna come up to that window where it's gonna ask me, do you want to activate all these Windows 10 features and whatnot, which I personally like to disable, but for the sake of moving this along, I'm just gonna leave it enabled later on, I can disable it. I um, I don't like I don't like all that you know too much data being sent over the internet to Microsoft or anybody else. And I like to keep things as private as possible. All right. The screen went dark, and it rebooted once more. Give it a sec. Give it a sec here, guys. Give it a sec. It's almost there. It's almost there. All right. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. That sound like uh. <laughs> here we go. I was gonna say I sound like uh, Elvis, but I probably don't. Elvis Presley. There it is. Cortana. I'm Cortana. No, Cortana. No, come on, Cortana. How do I get an exit out of this? Use your voice or the keyboard along the way. Come on, Cortana. Like to stay quiet, just select the little microphone icon towards the bottom of your screen. Yes. Come on. Come on, Cortana. All right, cool. Sure. Skip. And uh, let's do, I do need to connect real quick to my Wi-Fi, which is this one. I'm going to put my password in. I think that's right. Sure, sure, come on. Let's see how fast we can do this. By the way, By the way, this is like one of the record times for installing Windows 10, honestly. This is all real time. I haven't cut once. I haven't cut even one time. I can't wait to see the uh, the test, the crystal disk test on this. I'm really curious. 
I don't want to see what's new on Windows. Come on, man. Just just get in there. Just a moment. All right. I'm waiting. All right. There it is. Nope. I'm not going to use Microsoft account. No. No, 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 no. Come on. I don't want to use this. Come on, man. Back. Let's just do that a couple, man. I don't want to... Look, I hate this. Get a new one. Get, get a new... Create account. I'm trying to create a local account. And it's being so so difficult. They changed it. Create an account. No. I'm not... can't believe I'm spending so much time on this. This was, It was never like this, but... I don't want to create a Microsoft account. This is ridiculous. Oh my god. Fine. Fine, create a new account. Unbelievable. Yes, I know, I already have it somewhere else. I'm not gonna... This is ridiculous. I'm gonna create a local account later. My god. I'm just gonna put whatever. Oh, I probably shouldn't, otherwise I won't be able to log in. No, no, I had enough spying of you. See what I'm talking about? Oh, get out of here, man. Oh, I'm just gonna put in whatever. Jeez. Can't believe it's making me do all of this crap. I'm just gonna pick whatever. Unbelievable. And now it's... Look, this is so stupid. Now it's asking me for my phone number. 555-555-5555. I'm buff. Unbelievable, man. This is so ridiculous. It didn't do this before, I'm telling you. Oh, now he wants a pin? Now you want a... Man, zero 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 zero. Oh my God! Can't believe you're making me do this crap. Unbelievable. I'm sorry, guys. I didn't know it was gonna turn into this. What is the do you the more? No. I didn't know they was gonna. It, it's this is. Oh my god. I didn't. I did not think it was gonna take more longer than installing the Windows operating system. I hate you, Cortana. This is so stupid. Oh look, of course it's gonna. No. Mm. Decline. Oh my, look at all this crap. Now look at all this crap. I wasn't going to talk smack about them, but look at all this crap. All of that stuff is, is spying on you and trying to advertise to you and trying to sell you their service. I understand you got to have a business, but man, this is too much. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. My God. It really ruined my day, this 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 crap. Hopefully the benchmark of this. And I'm, I guarantee you, I will disable all of that stuff. I just don't have time to show you guys this right now. But I'll disable all of those services. Everything. Everything's going to be disabled. This is ridiculous. I, man, I'm, I'm this close. I'm this close to switching to Linux. This close. It's ridiculous. may take several minutes. I better not. I just put in a new new hard drive. New solid state M.2 
PCIe NVMe drive. I hate you, Microsoft. Look at this. It wants to restart immediately. Hell no. Where's the store? Stupid store. I have to go to stupid store to install this thing. Search Crystal Disk. Come on now. Can you guys see that? Yeah, you can. Where is a crystal disk? I know it's there. No. Come on. I know it's your stupid thing. Oh my god. I misspelled it. There it is, Crystal Disk app. Look at that. They made it so difficult to find. No. Get. Can't believe it, man. I have to jump through all these hoops. Come on. Install. All right. This is insanely ridiculous. All right, I'm going to do Okay, airplane mode is on. I can hear the laptop going doing overtime. So there's something going on here. Something is using power. Can you see that? Welcome my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. We have another video on a help desk example phone call in which we fix a WebEx sound issue. It's going to be an exciting one, it's going to be very educational and it's a real world example of something you would get as a phone call when you do help desk tier one. All right, guys, let's get into it. But first, real quick, please take one second to click that like button. This way I'm not going to play any ads at this point. This makes a huge difference for me. I really appreciate your help on this. Thank you so much. And now let's listen to the call. And then after that, during the call, we're going to pause in the middle of it and I'll show you how to fix this WebEx issue. My name is Irvin. How can I help you today? Hey, this is Bob. I, uh, I have, I'm having trouble with my um, uh, WebEx meeting. The audio doesn't work. I'm trying to use my headset going on. It's just that I've been told that uh, they can hear me, but I can't hear them. Or something's going on with, with my headset. I'm, I'm trying to use it for this WebEx. Either, like, it doesn't matter if I create a meeting or join a meeting. There's always the same issue with the headset. I can't. And it's a new headset I just got from my boss. I'm trying to use it here. And uh, it's just it's just giving me trouble. Is this something you can help me out with? I sure can. Uh, let me uh, let me uh, get your uh, PC name real quick. There should be a, a PC information uh, on your computer for that. It's it's uh, it could be a computer name or a workstation name. There might be even a sticker on your computer. Can you please give me that? Sure. Uh, here it is. It's a three five C three T O five seven eight. Thank you very much for that. Do you mind if I take control of your computer just for a moment? I want to have a look and see what's going on. Sure thing, go ahead, no problem. Now, just real quick, I want to make sure the type of headset that you have, is it a USB one or is it the one that has two prongs or uh, two connectors, if you will? So it's usually, it's uh, um, if it's just a standard one, it's going to have one that's red and the other one is black and you plug it in usually in the front of the PC or is just a USB one? I have one of those that's just a USB one. All right, no problem. I'm, I'm taking a look right now. 
All right, let's pause the phone call here for a moment so we can troubleshoot, so I can show you how I would troubleshoot this. He mentions uh, audio issues. So every time somebody mentions audio issues, I would definitely look at the audio settings inside the computer. And notice I specifically asked him if he has a USB type of uh, headset or if it's just one of those standard ones with two plugs. And uh, he said he has a USB one, so we're just gonna use that knowledge as our starting point. All right, let's look at the system settings. We're going to right click on our speaker icon here. I'm going to select open sound settings. These are Windows 10 sound settings. I'm not a big fan of this. It is pretty simple. And yes, you can do several troubleshooting in here, but I prefer to click on the sound control panel here, which is the old school way of pulling up and troubleshooting Windows operating systems. So I'm gonna minimize this WebEx here just so I can get that out of the way and not distract you with it. So as in, uh, the first thing we see here is that we have Realtek high definition audio. This is one of those audio systems that will be on pretty much every computer that has Windows operating system. I guarantee you that if you open up sound settings on your computer right now, you will have a Realtek high definition audio. And we know that this is default sound for that PC, meaning that everything that's built into the computer is going to use this and everything that is plugged into it as in specifically microphone or a headset through the regular 3.5 millimeter connector it's going to use Realtek so we can ignore that part of it right now because we're not going to use it we have to concentrate on a USB headset and he specifically you said the USB the only other thing that shows up here is this Plantronics C610 which is a USB headset and you can see there's a little you know there's a green check mark here that means that right now that Realtek is set as default I'm going to go ahead and change this Plantronics to default I'm going to select it I'm going to click set as default now I know for sure that everything on the system is going to use this playback audio as in speaker as default. So we changed our speakers to Plantronics C610, which is the headset itself. There is nothing else there. So we know for sure that that is the headset that he is using. Now let's go ahead and click on recording here. This is going to be set up for our microphone. And here we go again. We can see that he has a microphone either built in or plugged in somehow. But, you know, if it's a laptop, chances are that it's just a built-in microphone. And it's, again, set to Realtek. We don't want that. We want to set it to our Plantronics. And we're going to set it as default. Now, you don't necessarily want to do this as set, it, set things up as a default, depending on preference of the customer. But a lot of times, to make sure that the issue doesn't uh, repeat itself, this is what I like to do is set their main audio to default, whatever that might be. And I will, of course, double check that with the customer as well. So now I know that my microphone is set to the Plantronics, which is the headset. And also our speaker is set to Plantronics, which is the headset. I'm going to click OK. So now everything else that comes up should be using that as default. Now let's look at the WebEx. Now, keep in mind, WebEx is kind of tricky when it comes to setting up audio. If I click on the little cog here and I click, you know, just to click on it to see what are the settings. Where are the settings here for the WebEx? And of course, you can see this, that there is a preference. And once you open it up, you assume that the audio settings would be here, but they're not, unfortunately. You can see that there is account, my personal room, meeting, join, phone numbers, calendars, notifications, video system, but nothing talks about the audio. The audio is actually um, set up when you start a meeting or join a meeting. So let's go ahead and click start a meeting. And this is going to launch our little start a meeting pop up. So with the start meeting enabled here, I know our pop up comes up. We can see there are some things here that are flipping through and we can see that the, this is the audio setting right here. We're gonna look at that here in a moment, but let's look at this real quick. You see how it says here, use computer for audio. A lot of times if you have a desk phone, like one of those physical desk phones that are just sitting on your desk, there chances are there might be some kind of integration there and that uh, you want to make sure that it's not detected because you can use a desk phone for uh, WebEx meetings and, and whatnot, especially if it's a Cisco phone, uh, usually I, uh, over IP phone, which all the new phones are. But 
in our case we want to make sure that use computer for audio is selected and uh, let's go ahead and select on our settings here that are kind of flipping through we're going to click on that and see what we have and here we have to make a minor change and change the uh, microphone here to make sure that it reflects our Plantronics headset so we're going to select Plantronics headset or you can click use system settings I prefer just to click it uh, microphone uh, plan to set up Webex only and only Webex to use this headset you would make sure that it's selected to the microphone and not use system settings so in case you want to use system settings defaults for something else um, basically what I'm saying is you can configure Webex only to use the headset as well again I'm going to double check this with the customer to see what his preferences are all right let's get back to the phone call all right, sir, so it, it looks like there's uh, just a configuration issue with the audio. The headset is probably working just fine. I went ahead and made the changes in the system and the WebEx make sure that this is all set to use the headset most of the time. Now, just keep in mind, if you're going to use your PC speakers or if you have speakers connected to it, settings may have to be changed back. But right now, I set your headset to default. So that way, it's always going to use that for the time being. Um, if you'd like, I can change it. I can only change, I can just change WebEx to use it and nothing else. No, no, that's fine. I don't use the speakers at all. I headset is fine. I don't want people to hear me talking anyways or hear, hear what other people are saying on the meeting anyways. All right, no problem. I'll go ahead and leave it like that. So it's all set to default now and it should work. Do you want to give it a shot and test it out? Sure. Let me, uh, let me get my coworker over here. I'm going to start a meeting real quick and test it uh, with her. Hey Susan, you mind testing this with me? All right, thank you. Go ahead and join. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I can hear you fine too. Awesome, all right, cool. Thank you, thank you for testing this with me. Hello? Yeah, um, it's working. It's working fine now, so uh, th thanks for fixing that for me. It was, it was so annoying. Every time I joined the meeting, it just didn't work. No problem. I'm glad to help. Um, is there anything else I can assist you with today? No, that's it. Uh, you've been great help. Thank you so much. You bet. You have a good day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. And there you have it, guys. Another successful help desk tier one phone call handled like an IT professional. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. Check out my channel. I have a lot more of this type of stuff. I am already made a few of videos that are in this format, so if you, if you want to check them out, I, I forget exactly what they were. I think one of them was on resetting passwords, the other one was on some other stuff. Anyways, I have so much I can't remember. But anyways, I try to make these videos at least once a week. Typically, they come out on Saturdays or Sundays when I have free time, uh, you know, from my job and whatnot. But uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Please share it with friends. Let me know what you think. If you just want to say hi, I you know I like I like those comments as well. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. You have a wonderful day. <clears throat> bye bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, I want to talk about a specific VPN issue that you will come across that can quickly go downhill unless you handle it in a proper way. What I'm talking about is simply somebody calls in and says, can you reset my Windows login password? You need to stop right away. If they're on VPN, you can't just reset their password because it can go quickly downhill from there. You can make a lot more problems for yourself unless you follow these exact steps. So this issue happens a lot when person's password expires. Their password expires and suddenly they cannot get onto VPN. They can typically log into their computer, but they can't get on their VPN because they don't get that prompt to change their password at all. And they can't just do control alt delete. This is where you can usually click change password or it would just it would just force you to change the password. They can't do that because they're not on VPN yet. They are disconnected at this time. So 
The only thing they can do, as they typically do, is just call help desk and ask for a password reset. But we got to make sure that we don't just jump into resetting until we do a couple of things first. Let's have a look how I handle this call. And I hope you like my role playing. Uh, if you do, please take a second to like this video. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. So user decides that they need to change their password, so they need help with that. So what they do is they pick up the phone and call the help desk. And it goes something like this. Hi, my name is Bob. Can you uh, reset my password? I'm having a lot of trouble logging in. Can you reset my password? Sure thing, sir. I can reset your password. So this is something you would normally say to anybody who calls in and asks for a password change or a reset. So what can you do with that? The thing is, though, you have to keep in mind that when he's on VPN, he will not be able to take that temporary password that you've given to him and change it to his permanent password. Well, why is that? He's not connected to the same domain that you're changing his password on. So the question we need to ask him first is, are you able, sir, are you able to get on VPN? No, I, uh, I can't. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm not on VPN. I can't log into VPN. That's why I need you to reset my password. Sure thing, sir. But keep in mind that unless you're on a VPN, uh, me changing your password is not going to help you. Now, just to make sure, are you already logged in to the computer? Oh, uh, no, not not at the time. It's not at the moment. Uh, you want me to log in? Yes, please, sir. Uh, please log into the computer and make sure you stay logged in. Uh, I can't give you a temporary password uh, because the system is set up in such way where you can't change it to your permanent password until you're connected with your VPN first. And in order for you to connect to the VPN first, I got to give you a permanent password because it just won't work. You can't use your temporary password to log into the VPN. And once you are logged into VPN, uh, you can go ahead and update all your other systems by simply locking your computer and then unlocking your computer with your new permanent password. Unfortunately, yet again, I can't give you a temporary password because of the current uh, setup and the system setup situation that we have. And um, that's the only way I can help you with that. I hope that works out for you. Oh, that will that'll work out for me. I just, uh, you know, thanks for telling me that. I'm going to make sure that I use this per permanent password. And then I just want to make sure I can get on right now. Thanks for your help. Sure thing, sir. I, I just wanted to make sure that you can get on VPN as a, as a number one thing. Uh, so that way, you know, you can get back to work or do whatever you need to do. Uh, but uh, yeah, is there anything else I need uh, you need help with? No, I'm okay. Thanks for your help. I appreciate it. Yeah, you have a nice day. All right. Thank you, sir. And you as well. Have a good one. Bye bye. And there you have it, my friends. The only thing left to do here is show you footage from one of my videos on how to reset a password in Active Directory. Let me know if you like my puppeteering. I know you can probably see my mouse pointer moving the hands up and down. I hope this is something that people uh, might uh, find enjoyable. I uh, just kind of kind of uh, overview of what we gone over. The number one thing to keep mind in mind here is that if somebody is trying to connect to VPN, they need to have a working permanent password. If their password has expired, they obviously can't change it uh, when they are not connected to the VPN. Because remember, when you call help desk, you give them a temporary password, at which point they get a notification or force to change it to a permanent password. That doesn't happen when you're trying to connect to the VPN. And if you're not on VPN, you're not going to be able to get that notification or that prompt at all. So you got to give them a permanent password. And if they decide to change it afterwards to something else, they can. So this is something you can mention as well. All right. Thank you so much for watching. And again, here is my video on how to change passwords and Active Directory. 
All right, let's go ahead and open up Active Directory. And within Active Directory on the left hand side, you can see a folder that's called Users. If you select that, if you select users, you can see that a bunch of different users and groups show up in there. So you can scroll down and look for that login or the person's name. However, the easiest way to look somebody up is if you right click the users folder and select find. In here, you can type in the name of the user and he said Irvin underscore C-A-N. So it's going to click find now. And here it is. We found the user. We can simply select it, double click it, and it should pull up user's account. So let's see what's going on with that. He said he can't log in. So the next thing we're going to look up is the password. So we're going to click on the account. If we suspect that user is locked in the account tab here, we can simply click on the check mark like this where it says unlock account, select apply or OK and this will unlock the user's account. Now we can get back to them and let them know to try again. Well, there you go, my friends. This is how you fully handle a help desk call in which you would unlock user accounts. Of course, there are other things you can look at. If you go to the account, you can make some changes to it when it related to password. If you want to change their password, you can change it here. If you select user must change password at the next logon, is something what I would um, uh, highly recommend in a business environment. So this is a part of security. You want the user to have their own password. So I highly suggest that you check user must change their password at the next login because after you change it, you give them a temporary password, they should be able to set their own. In order to change the password, we have to go back to the users folder and then find the user and then right click it and then select reset password. However, this is kind of counterpoint to what I said earlier that, you know, if this is populated with thousands and thousands of users, it may not be easy to find. However, if you do right click on the users folder, select find and do the thing I told you earlier is to type in, you can find this user here since we found it already we don't have to dig through active directory a lot of people actually don't show this on their videos when they show how to reset the password is that now since you already found it you don't have to dig and kind of like you know your eyes are starting to dry out because you're trying to find this user you can just find it here and then right click and reset password and we're going to change the password to something temporarily And then again, make sure this is checked. User must change the password at the next login. And then if their account is locked as well, you can check that as well. And then just click OK. And now it says the password for Irvin has been changed. All right, guys, I hope you find this video useful. Please share it with your friends. Let them know about me and ask them what they think. Are these videos useful to you. I think they are. I appreciate you watching. Have a good day and don't forget to ask me any questions that you may have in the comments below. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. The second ticket is about either one because it does have an error that comes up. So pay attention to that error and then we're going to work through it together. Hi guys, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Today's video is about help desk tickets, most common help desk tickets that come through the system. It's based off my video that I made recently for training purposes. It's about two hours long if you want to check it out. It's an excellent video for people trying to get a feel of what Help Desk is about. Topics are going to be based off of that. So what I'm doing is, is taking parts of that from the videos and creating separate videos for each topic because in that video there are 12 separate issues that are most common to Help Desk. I hope you guys like it. Please take a moment to click the like button. Every time you guys do that, I really appreciate it. And I know you guys do it too. Thank you so much. Next one is my email is not working. By Mr. Mike Moser again. Oh, okay. This is an interesting one. You will get this quite a bit. 
And um, if you guys want to guess, I'll pause briefly by talking about it. And you guys can get a chance to actually guess what the issue might be. This is the pop-up the user gets. But but first, uh, email's not working. I got to assign it. Assign it to myself so I can get credit for it. So that way I can get paid when my boss look at, looks at the statistics of how many tickets I've done. So it is my email is not working. And then it says Outlook is asking for my login and password. Why do you why do you guys think that happens? If you're watching this in my premiere video, why do you think this happens? So they open up Outlook and the first thing they see is this. You know, they see this pop up. This is what happens. And it looks to be I'm trying to open it here in a bigger there it is. And it looks to be asking for their login ID and password, right? And it talks about credentials here. So that's what we're going to kind of concentrate on because chances are what happened is, and we're going to ask the customer this. Hello, my name is Irvin with PCA Support. And by, you know, chances are uh, the Mike, Mike Moser here uh, already knows us, he knows who we are, so... Maybe we don't have to introduce ourselves in this case. But, you know, if you don't know them, keep doing it. It's part of the job. I have your... Sorry, guys. Ticket about email not working. Did you, by chance, change your password recently? So, guys, this is exactly what I'm suspecting here, is that either his, his password, Mike's password expired, and he changed it while he was already inside the Windows. Some companies provide, a, provide you with a, a way to reset your password, especially if it's a single sign-on, meaning that company can have a single sign-on credentials set up for every system that they use, which can, for which you can change the password on just a website. Like one of the websites will use that single sign-on. That single sign-on is going to be your domain login or your computer login. So when you go to a website that requires that single sign-on, also known as SSO, it's going to ask for your domain login. If your domain login's password expired that day, it's going to ask you to change that password. When you change your password on the website, your computer is not going to reflect that password necessarily right away. What do I mean by that? Your computer that you're logged in, you're still logged in with your old password. So what you have to do is actually do a Windows L and lock the computer and then type in your new password before you open up other programs. If you don't, you get this pop-up. This is what happens. And maybe, also, maybe, he locked himself out out of the computer. So we're going to concentrate on that. And with the reply, I suspect it's going to be 99% chance that this is the issue. What we're going to do is actually go in and reset their password just to kind of get it going for them in case they forgot the password. Because maybe they forgot the password, typed it in 10 times, and then now they're locked out. And their Outlook doesn't have their current password. You know, but this mostly happens when they change the password and they don't know their new password or it hasn't, again, replicated on their local computer. The websites that use the password are fine, but the system itself hasn't received the new password. And that's the issue here, most likely. So we're going to go inside of Active Directory. And this is my virtual server here. And... Just gonna log in real quick here. I'm gonna open up Active Directory, Windows Admin Tools, and Active Directory Users and Computers. The company you work for doing help desk may have a web, just like a website or a tool that basically what it allows you to do is the same thing as I'm doing right now. It may not give you direct access to Active Directory at all, which is normal is unfortunate but it's a normal so you may have different means but 
you are basically doing exactly what I'm doing and that is changing their password and unlocking their account just in case. So what I like to do is, you see the uh, users folder on the right hand, so instead of searching through here to see where Mike Moser is, and uh, I know I can see him there, but th this could be populated with thousands of users, we don't know. So what I'm going to do is right click the folder, I'm going to click find. And then in, in search here, I'm going to type in Mike Moser. We can also ask him for his login ID, what he uses to log into the computer. And here he is. We found them right away. We don't have to search through thousands of different names. We found them right away. We're going to right click him, right click him, and then we're going to click reset password. So we're going to change the password. We're going to give him a new password. What I like to do is give him a simple password. Like, what is today? Tuesday. One, two, three, four, five, six. Again, Tuesday. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is a, going to be a temporary password. This is why it's so simple. I want to give a user a simple password to change because he's going to change it right away. And you can see here that there's a check mark already. It says user must change the password at next login. The user must log off and then log on again for a change to take effect. So they're going to change it. As soon as I tell them, okay, your new password is Tuesday, one, two, three, four, five, six with capital T, they're going to be forced to change it right away and hopefully to something way more secure. Uh, but this is what I like to do. Uh, it's up to you. Some places don't allow this to according to the group policy, but this is what I do typically. Um, if my company requires me to do something else or disables my ability to change this, then, then I'm going to use that. But this is what I like to do as, as it is. And I'm going to do a check mark here where it says unlock the user's account. So in case he is locked out, it's going to unlock him. I'm going to click OK. It says the password has been changed for Mike Moser. And I'm going to tell Mike, hello, Mike, I have changed your password. Go ahead and type it in again. Or what I would actually say, go ahead and lock your like this. Lock your computer, Mike. And then do Control-Alt-Delete. And then type in your new password. And then it's going to force him to change the password at that point. And that should be good enough and should fix that issue with the, uh, whatchamacallit, with Outlook. He should no longer get this Outlook pop-up at all. Because now, Outlook, since it's part of Windows operating system, once you install it, once you have it installed, it becomes part of Windows operating system. It will detect the new password. And even if it doesn't, even if it comes up again, he'll know what the new password is and he can just type it in and you can guide him through this. What I also like to do is tell him to go ahead and reboot the computer afterwards. That way it's going to ensure that everything in the background running, whether he has email open in the background or any other Microsoft products, including Office, if you keep in mind, Outlook is part of Office. So if you have anything else running, you may have to close all of it in order to, for it to take effect. So I tell them, just reboot the computer. It's going to flush everything, you know. And that's the simple way of dealing with this. And I'm going to add external node here and say, resolve issue by password reset. I'm going to keep it simple like this. And this will resolve this issue. I guarantee it. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you. I am um, trying to make as much as many videos as I can when it comes to this type of topic. I also try to branch out to other things that are more advanced, tier two, tier three, system admin, network admin, and whatnot. I have a huge collection of videos that you can check out that I've already made. Chances are, if you think of a topic and you wanted to ask me about it, please do in the comments below. But you can also go to my channel. Just go to youtube.com forward slash Kobuman. And there is a search button right underneath the uh, picture of the channel. There is a search button in there. So if you want to click on that and just type in the topic, chances are I have it. I also have a website called CosmicNovo.com. There's lots of 
has a lots of written material you can check out and especially if you are interested in help when it comes to getting that job so interview questions and answers i have a lot of that stuff all right thanks again please share a like and leave a comment thank you so much bye bye Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. This is an example of a help desk or a call center phone call in which you deal with an angry customer. So this is incredibly important to know because you got to have the skill in order to resolve their issues. Sometimes a customer is so angry that you got to deal with it in a special way. So that way you can resolve this issue without it being escalated to your manager. So this is an incredibly important video, not just technically, and I'll show you what the problem is with the computer, but also in a way to deal with it. So it's a social video in a sense. All right, guys, let's have a look. But before we do that, please take one second to like my video. This really makes a huge difference. And that way I'm not going to play any ads for you. So what's going to happen, I'm going to show you the customer's phone call, an example phone call. And then I'm going to pause the video and show you how to I fix it. And most of all, on how I dealt with this angry customer. Again, thank you so much for your support and let's enjoy. Thank you for calling tech support. My name is Irvin. How can I help you today? Oh my God, look, I need you to fix my computer, all right? Look, everything is broken. I can't open anything. All right, sir, no problem. I'm sure I can help you with this. What seems to be uh, the issue? You know, what are I'm you, trying I... to open up these Word documents, you know, all my Excels, nothing is working. It's just it, the, the icons kind of changed. I, I don't know. When I click on it, nothing happens. It just doesn't want to. Look, I need this fixed right away because I got important things to do, all right? All right, sure, so, hey, sir. sir, no problem. I'm sure I can help you. I'm sure we'll fix this for you. Just uh, uh, just give me a few moments here. Right? I hate to do this to you, but can you please give me the PC name? That way I can help you as fast as, I, as, fast as possible, all right? That way I can possibly take over your computer and just do it for you, all right? P PC name? What is this PC name thing? Well, there should, sir, there should be a, um, an icon or on your desktop or something that says PC information or maybe a sticker on the computer that with a PC name. All right, all right. Let me let me see. Hold on, hold on. Let me see. Oh, I I, I see it. I see it. I see a sticker here. All right, great, sir. Can you please give me that? That way I can just help you real quick. All right, it's uh three five seven zero C O T A F L. All right, thank you, sir, very much for that. All right, all right, I'm gonna make sure that I look at your computer. Okay, so what's gonna happen is I'm gonna uh, request to take control of your computer and all you gotta do is just click accept if there's a pop-up or anything like that. Just make sure you click accept on that. All right, all right, all right, all right, I see it. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for accepting that. All right, I'm gonna have a look now and I'm gonna fix it for you, all right? Don't worry, just, just hang tight, please. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's pause the phone call for just a moment to see what's going on here. And you can see that the customer here is trying to open these documents and it just keeps asking for something to open it with. Uh, these are Excel and Word type of documents. You can see they are uh, extension on them is ODT and ODS. These are basically um, uh, open office type of documents. They can also be opened with regular Microsoft Office. But in this case, we're just going to reinstall open office in this and this is going to resolve the issue. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. Of course, in a business type of environment, you would have a different type of tool. But in my case, I'm just going to install the executable that I've downloaded with OpenOffice, and this will fix it. Okay, sir. Hello, sir. Thank you very much for holding. Look, I, I found the problem for you. Uh, I just need a few moments to fix it, but I guarantee you I will fix it for you. The thing is, though, the uh, Microsoft uh, Office or uh, the software basically used to... Uh, open these programs for you uh, is removed for some reason. I'm going to have to reinstall it. Unfortunately, this may need a restart. Oh my God. Sir, I'm really sorry, but I guarantee you this will fix it. Um, it, it may restart, it may not, but if it does, it shouldn't take too long, but I guarantee you will fix it. All right. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to reinstall it and then it should work for you. Just give me a moment here. All right, fine. All right, sir, I'm initiating it right now. It's happening, and uh, it, what I'm just kind of waiting for it to install, um, just you know, just ask you real quick, do you need to save anything just in case the computer decides to reboot on you? Because a lot of times when you install these big programs, it likes to reboot for some reason. I don't want you to lose anything else, you know? All right, let me check. Uh, 
Yeah, I don't. No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're fine. You're fine. All right, sir. Thank you very much. And thank you again for being patient with me. I guarantee this will fix it for you. You just need a few moments and possible restart, but it should be good to go. And uh, hopefully this, this computer is fast, so that way we can get back to them real quick. So I'm just going to keep clicking next. And so far it's going really quick. And again, a uh, business you work for may have different type of tool that deploys these type of applications. You might want to go in there and do a repair or whatnot if it is Microsoft Office. But in this case, um, it is open office. But either way, we're going to resolve the issue. All right, that was really quick, which is good. That means we can get back to the customer real quick. And you can see now that we can open these uh, just documents. These are just fake documents that I created for the sake of video. And you can see now that it's working. All right, let's get back to the customer. It looks, oh, well, it looks like it installed and uh, I don't see any reboot uh, requirements. So I think you're good to go. Um, you want to check it out before I? Let me, uh, let me have a look real quick. All right. All right. All right. Looks good. All right. Good. All right. Thanks. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. All right, no problem, sir. I, you know, I, I understand the frustration. It, it happens, but you know, you're good to go now. Is there anything else I can help you with? No, I'm good. Thanks. All right, thank you for calling Tech Support. You have a good day. All right, you too. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. There you go, my friends. That's how you handle a, an angry customer. I uh, I made this video as best as I can in order to show you guys how to do it because it is kind of awkward to on help desk, desktop support, system administration, network administration, and all kinds of other IT stuff that you can learn from. And I also have, if you're interested in this type of stuff, I also have more videos in this type of format where it shows you how to deal with certain issues and technical issues that you may come across as a help desk technician and again if you're doing just call center type of stuff these videos are also helpful all right thank you so much for watching please share this video if you have a second click the like button i really appreciate that as well thank you again and you have a wonderful day bye bye Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Let's keep it moving. If you watched my previous videos, you know that I've been on a roll with these help desk uh, tutorials. We're going to keep it moving with third party software. You have to be allowed to install third party software, meaning the biggest issue here is obviously having a license. You got to have a license to install third party software. The second thing is whether it's allowed by the policy in relation to the company on how they deal with security when it comes to type of software, because some software may be a risk to the company and we don't want to install that and you don't want to lose your job. So it's incredibly important that you uh, are very careful, especially as help desk. But what you take from this video is that you got to be careful when it comes to somebody requesting software. There is a procedure for that and that procedure has to be followed. As simple as that. So let's have a look at how that goes. I need to have Oracle DB, Oracle database installed. On my computer, I'm going to assign it to myself and we're going to work it. We're going to keep it going, guys. We're just going to keep it going. All right. It says I need to have Oracle DB installed on my computer. And same thing repeated in description, and it's this guy named Mike Moser. All right, Mike, so you got to be careful with this because when it comes to installing third-party software, and this guy, is, in this case, Oracle Database, is a third-party software, no matter how you look at it, we have to make sure that it's okay for you to install this for them. So... What we're actually going to do, and preferably you'd want to talk to the customer over the phone. This is how I prefer it. You can do it any way you like. You can send an email, a reply to them. You can send them an instant message and see, uh, see if you can get more information. But what would you guys do? How would you guys handle this? You got to be very, very careful because we can't, we can't just install oracle database on their computer without permission so here's here are a couple of different things that could be happening here mike here mike moser he may already have a license to install oracle db 
and he already maybe has requested it over requested it through proper channels and maybe he just doesn't know how to install it and he already has all of this all of these permissions so we're going to ask him this we're going to start with this hello you guessed it my name is Irvin you're going to be doing this a lot except you're going to be using your own name of course <laughs> with PC support I have your ticket about installing Oracle DB do you have or let's just do this there are many ways of doing this did you request a license for this software software or and you know we can send this or depends how how it is on your in your business in your setup in your business you can also say before I install this software I have to check to see if it's on approved software list so if you send a message to him like this it kind of gives it almost like open-ended in the sense that customer may reply to you and say hey I already have it I already have it I just need it installed meaning that I already have it approved. Of course, you have to check that real quick. And then sometimes you may have to install it manually. But also, he, Mike, might actually already have it installed. Might, might, might even have it installed already on his computer. In which case, he may need help with configuration, which is not necessarily something that you as help desk uh, tier one would be able to do. But if you're doing desktop support or tier two help desk, you should be able to configure software. In this case, Oracle database, uh, you may need like things like a uh, database driver installed or something like that. And I'll show you that as soon as I, uh, I'll show you that briefly as soon as I, you know, kind of talk about this part of it. But when it comes to help desk tier one, you have to make sure number one, that it's approved and number two, that you install it for them, whatever that might be. You may have a program that handles pushing of the software to the computers and you may help them, you may need to help them subscribe their computer to this piece of software. Subscribe meaning that basically um, you tell the system that his computer name, and remember we use Kobelman1 as a computer name a lot, that it has that computer, Kobelman1 subscribe to Oracle DB. So what in, in, in that case, it should automatically install itself. But it also, what he might mean is actually configuration. So you have to check that. But if, when it comes to just simple installation, you should be able to handle this as help desk tier one. Now, let me just show you briefly what I mean by setting up Oracle database. I'm just going to, it's a little bit slightly off topic, but I do want to show you if when it's done through administrative tools here on the computer itself, and it's done here under one of these. So let's say you're installing or configuring Oracle database driver. It would be somewhere in here. And what happens is, is that you would have uh, the Oracle driver in here. You know, for example, in here, you would have a Oracle driver that's already in there. And then you configure it, whatever the system that you want. So you would just click add, and then you would select which one you want to use. And then you go in through the configuration, set up the ports, IP addresses, uh, server names, or whatever it needs to be. So if you're not comfortable with that, that's fine. You don't necessarily have to be the guy that does it. It just depends on the level and the requirements for the company. Again, this is possibly help desk tier two, definitely desktop support. Uh, person would actually deal with this okay I'm gonna go back to that system all right but in this case we're gonna assume that he just wanted it installed so we went ahead and installed it I'm gonna add internal node install well let's do this let's do this subscribed PC 
to Oracle DB means that we told the internal system to go ahead and push and the internal system or internal setup has approved it for it to be installed and then I'm going to do this installed software as requested okay and now we're going to close the ticket as complete all right easy peasy and there you have it guys just make sure you follow these basic rules when it comes to dealing with this and it's not going to be a problem for you in the future thank you guys so much for watching please don't forget to like share and leave comments i'm sorry if i missed any of your comments during the premiere and uh yeah i'm not trying to ignore anybody at any point but if i if just in case if i do i apologize you can always leave a comment below and i'll gladly answer any of your questions or if you just want to say hi all right guys i'll see you next time have a wonderful day bye bye hey guys here we go again my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. we're continuing where we left off our previous video was about outlook issue today it's going to be about a printer I'm going to work the printer ticket. I'm going to show you how to install a printer for a user and how you can also communicate that with the user in a proper way so it's not confusing because there are multiple things you actually have to get from the user in order to do this properly. It's a really good video for a help desk. That being said, it's based or it comes from my large video that I made that's about two hour long training specifically for help desk. If you want to check that out, it's right there. And that being said, please, Take one second to like the video. I know I say this every video, but thank you so much, guys. You're awesome. All right, let's get into it. By the way, if you're still with me, thank you so much. I appreciate you guys so much. One more ticket, guys. It's this one here. It says, I need help installing a printer. Very common one. Very good one. We're going to work on this one. I need help installing printer. Sorry, guys, I'm changing a little bit here because I'm getting a little tired. Uh, but we're going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to fight through. We're almost, almost done here. I'm trying to install a printer, but it's not working. We're going to reply to the customer. I say, hello, my name is Irvin with Help Desk. What kind of printer are you trying to add local printer or network printer now this can be confusing to to the user to the customer because what i'm actually trying to figure out it's actually are they at home are they working from home? Are they trying to add, add a local printer? Or are they trying to add a network printer, which is actually in an, in an office? But to them, network printer could also be a local printer. Sometimes they don't know, you know, but that's okay. We're trying to find more information about it and see what's going on. But we can also say also, can you please send me your PC name? with and you know what let's 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 hold off on this part of it because what they reply here next is going to be very crucial so if they first reply and say and usually I, I like to be more proactive but i don't want to be i don't want it to be too much for the user because sometimes users can't and this is not their fault is this is just how human mind works they can't multitask if I'm asking you too many things at once, it may be confusing. So I'm going to wait for them to reply to this. And they may say, well, it's my local printer at home. Or it's printer at the office. Scenario number one, local printer. Question number two, are you allowed to install a printer, local printer for somebody that works from home? This is another security issue. This has to be approved and allowed by your company. 
You should know this, or if you don't, ask a coworker, ask your manager, whether they're allowed, whether you are allowed to install local printer for them. And I'll show you how you can do that. If it's a network printer, then that should be no problem. You know, they some people are not allowed to print either, depending who they are. But chances are they are allowed to print on a network printer because it's at the office. You know, there's a, a there there are recycle bins there that are security recycle bins. Chances are that will recycle sensitive material and all that stuff. Companies don't really like to actually have printers around uh, because of security issues. So we got to be careful about this. We got to find this out. Um, if possible, I would call them and talk to them. Uh, if not, I would find a faster way of actually asking multiple questions like over IM and not necessarily over email. I would not handle this over email because there are more things that uh, we, we need to find out. But in this case, let's pretend that they want to add a network printer and then we're going to say after they after we get their reply, say, okay, in that case, can you please send me the IP address of the printer you're trying to add? Let's do this. I can add the printer for you. However, I need your PC name to take control remotely. So you got to word this the best way you can because we you know we're doing multiple things here and we're trying to get multiple pieces of information from them and we're going to do this so let's kind of go over it again okay i can add the printer for you however i need your pc name to take control of scroll remotely and can you please send me the ip address of the printer you're trying to add so of your PC remotely. So we need to know their PC name and I didn't want to say can you send me your PC name or IP address because I'm already asking for IP address for their printer and I don't want there to be any confusion on the customer's part. I want them to give me PC name and the IP addresses of the printer. IP address of the printer trying to add. You see what I'm saying? Keep it as simple as possible, but trying to get as much information as you can as quickly as possible in a easy to understand manner. Once we get this information, we're going to go to their computer and here we are at their computer again. Uh, we're again assuming that we're using the same computer name that we used throughout this whole lesson. And the way you would check to see what kind of printers they have installed, we're going to go to the search bar. And you, can, you can get to this through the control panel as well. But I'm going to say devices and printers. Here we go. Printers and scanners, devices and printers. We want to get to here, guys. This is, this is where you can see device number and i'll show you a different version of it which is was the typical one but this is the what i call mickey mouse version of windows 10 that shows you more a large letter font type of thing where it simply shows you if there are any printers installed already and they would all be here all right and then if it's not here which we don't see one we can simply click add a new one so now it's looking for what it's doing is searching for printers and scanners locally and on the network and if it doesn't find one, we can simply click here, the printer, uh, the, the printer that I want isn't listed. Other way of going to this here is control panel, devices and printers here. And we can see right away that it looks totally different than what we were looking at before. This is actually showing us the whole thing that's on here. It's showing us the whole thing that's connected to the computer devices and printers so every device you know whether it's a usb or or whatnot or monitor or you know the headset that we talked about earlier 
And of course, if there are any printers, they will be listed here. But of course, there is a button. Guess where we need to go? We're going to click on the Add Printer. And this is the same thing we looked at earlier, but this is just how it looks like. That's how it used to look like before. Before Windows 10, Mickey Mouse looking stuff, you know. And uh, <laughs> they, they try to make everything look so pretty and that just created multiple places for the same thing, which doesn't make sense to me. Why not just keep it the way it is, where it's just one place for one thing? You know, anyways, that's a different video. Okay, so it's not going to find anything. What I'm going to do is click uh, the printer that I want isn't listed. So same thing we did earlier. And then here you can add the printer multiple ways, where it's a Bluetooth wireless local printer, blah, blah, blah. Select anything that you want. But in this case, we're going to select and network printer which is going to be added using TCP IP address or host name or an IP address that we got from the customer and here we're just going to type it in for example 168.2.1 whatever it's whatever the static IP address is for that printer it's going to have to be a static IP address because you know it's a printer it doesn't we got to have a static IP address so everybody can connect to the same printer all the time and then we're going to leave it here where it says query the printer and automatically select the driver to use. What that does, it pings the printer and says, hey, I'm trying to add you, but do you have a driver? And then the, if it's like a more advanced or a newer printer, it's going to have that driver. It's going to automatically push it to the computer and it's going to install it. You know, Same thing when you're adding a local printer, you may have to download the driver, install the driver, but then you would just simply search for the specific name of the printer. You know, once you click next, it may, if it doesn't find, if it doesn't find the driver and it's going to bring you to, uh, nothing's going to happen here. So I can't really show you this at this time, but what happens, it's, it's going to say, okay, I found this IP address. I know it's a printer there, but which one is it? And then you go through a list that's available there and you select which model, like for example, Xerox, blah, blah, blah. And you select and you tell it which printer there is. That, that which type of printer that you're trying to connect so if it doesn't query and download the driver automatically you're going to have to ask the user can you tell me the name and model of that printer so that way you can get those drivers and install them properly once you do that it's going to automatically <clears throat> set it as default kind of like this so if you see one like that just make sure that it's set as default as the one that she wants he or she wants and then make sure it's set as default. See it have that uh, green um, circle with a check mark in the middle. Okay, and now we're going to add a external or internal note, I should say, added printer as requested. Irvin. And I'm going to close the ticket. Well, there you have it, guys. Thank you so much for watching this uh, short premiere video. I know it's short. I wish I could uh, make them longer. Uh, I will do that sometimes as well. But these short ones, I can at least take a break from my work, from my main job. So that way I can hang out with you guys. In case you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, leave them in the comments below. I'm sorry if I missed your uh, questions. I know it, it happens really quick sometimes. And if you do still have a question and need me to answer it, please leave it in the comments below. All right, guys, that's all for today. I'll see you next time, maybe even tomorrow. We'll see. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi guys, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Today's video is about help desk tickets, most common help desk tickets that come through the system. It's based off my video that I made recently for training purposes. It's about two hours long if you want to check it out. It's an excellent video for people trying to get a feel of what help desk is about. Topics are going to be based off of that. So what I'm doing is, is taking parts of that from the videos and creating separate videos for each topic because in that video there are 12 separate issues that are most common to help desk. I hope you guys like it. Please take a moment to click the like button. Every time you guys do that, I really appreciate it. And I know you guys do it too. Thank you so much. 
first topic is going to be about PDF file not working. It's an interesting one. Pay attention on how I deal with this and also how I deal with the customer when it comes to communicating this issue with them. Very important. First ticket we have here, it's called PDF files don't open. Of course, make sure that you assign the ticket to yourself when you're working it so you can get credit for it. The title of this one says PDF, PDF files do not open or don't open. And in the description, it says, for some reason, PDF files do not work. So what do you guys think the issue is here? I'm going to allow a few seconds here in case you're interacting uh, live with me or watching this video to uh, for you to give me the answer. But I'm going to also keep it moving at the same time, but give you a little bit time to answer uh, before I actually give you the answer for this. While you guys do that, I'm going to reply to the customer and I'm going to get some information from them first. First, I'm going to introduce myself. Hello, my name is Irvin with, why well, I can't spell today, with help desk support. I have your ticket about PDF files not working. Can you please send me computer name or IP address? So when I reply to this customer and I click save here, it's going to send them an email and it's going to ask them this information that I am inquiring about. And the reason for that is because in this situation, we're going to have to access their computer with remote desktop in order to resolve this issue. Uh, sometimes we can fix these things just by telling them on how to fix it, but it's preferable, if possible, for you to actually fix it and not necessarily tell the user how to fix it. If you have to, that's fine. Of course, this is going to depend on the company that you work for. You know, it depends on the, what the requirements are, but chances are if you're help desk, you're going to take control of their computer, take a look at the problem and resolve it as quickly as possible. So for that to happen, for us to use remote desktop, we're going to need their computer name or IP address. Both of those things are valid for us to use in order to access their computer remotely. So in this case, PDF files do not work. So number one thing that usually happens is that PDF reader is not installed. So so Adobe program is not installed that allow us to view PDF files. A lot of times that's the main thing. Or there are alternative software that they can be used to view PDF files, but chances are this is what's happening. Second thing that can happen is that it's file association thing. You may have Adobe installed on the computer, but if if it's still not or if the PDF files are still not using um, Adobe Reader to open or nothing happens, that means we need to change the uh, file association. We're going to change that right now. Now keep in mind that when it comes to dealing with users or customers, follow the instructions that they have on the ticket on how they prefer to be contacted. In this case, all I did was reply to their request because I know that this will send them an email. However, they may sometimes specify they want to be contacted via, um, via, you know, via phone, or they just want maybe uh, some kind of an instant message. Uh, some, you know, most companies are going to have some kind of instant messaging system, or they just want email reply. Whatever their preferences are, make sure you make sure you follow that to the T. Very important because those are this is what user feels most comfortable with. In this case, we send them an email, and once we get a reply, and let's say you're, uh, since this is a fictional customer, uh, let's say we do get a reply, and um, let's say maybe we are talking to them. Maybe the customer said that the PC name is C-O-B-U-M-A-N-1. So what I'm going to do, in that case, I'm going to add an internal note for us, um, as in tech support people, to have on file. So I'm going to say users PC name is Kobuman1. 
So I'm going to use that to access this Kobuman 1 PC and then see what's going on. All right, now let's look at that system. All right, here we are inside of the system. I'm going to show you how you would check for this. First thing I'm going to do is just search for Adobe right there. So that's good. We know Adobe's installed. If it's not installed, we're going to reinstall it, given that uh, your company allows for Adobe Reader to be installed, which chances are it will be. If it's still not working, I'm just going to open up File Association, which is also known as Default Apps in Windows. Um, there is also a file association different window that kind of looks like this, but this is what it is now in Windows 10. As soon as this loads, we're going to look for PDF. So I'm just going to scroll down and we're going to look on the left left hand side here for .pdf extension. So if we scroll down, it should be here. Here we go. O, and then we're coming, uh, we're approaching P. So should be here shortly, PDF. There it is, PDF. We can now see that PDF, in this case, is actually opened in uh, Microsoft Edge. We simply click on that and change it to Adobe Reader. There you go, problem solved. Uh, some people prefer for PDF to be opened up in a browser, which is fine too, you just ask them what they want. All right. All right, that ticket is resolved. I'm going to add internal note, changed file association. Sorry guys, I can't concentrate on spelling today properly, but good thing we have that red underline thing. I can just right click, change file association to allow PDF to Change file association to resolve PDF issues. That's fine. We know what we did. So if anybody else looks at that, whether it's your boss or, you know, somebody has to refer to it, to that ticket and see what you did, they'll know what you did. So issue resolved. We're going to close this ticket as such. So yeah, keep in mind, follow the rules of what the customer prefers to be uh, with the rules that in which customer prefers to be to. Very important. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you. Uh, I am trying to make as much as many videos as I can when it comes to this type of topic. I also try to branch out to other things that are more advanced, tier two, tier three, system admin, network admin, and whatnot. I have a huge collection of videos that you can check out that I've already made. Chances are, if you think of a topic and you wanted to ask me about it, please do in the comments below. But you can also go to my channel. Just go to youtube.com forward slash Kobuman. And there is a search button right underneath the uh, picture of the channel. There is a search button in there. So if you want to click on that and just type in the topic, chances are I have it. I also have a website called CosmicNovo.com. It has a lots of written material you can check out, and especially if you're interested in health.